He uh, ready to be queued up. Looks like he's there. Yep. Yep. I am here. All right, Reverend. Thank you for being here today, sir. It is my it is my pleasure and honor. Okay. Uh, everybody ready to go? Looks like everybody's set to go. Very good. If everybody would be kind enough to silence their uh, electronic devices and make sure you control your mic so we don't backfeed so that uh, each of the commissioners as well as staff and the public can hear things. Welcome to the uh, June 9th, 2020 Board of County Commission meeting. It will be held virtually utilizing communications media technology made permissible pursuant to the governor's executive orders. This meeting may be viewed on SGTV channel live stream from the Board of County Commissioners web link page or Seminole County's YouTube channel. Residents can provide public comment by registering to speak on the Seminole County website and Board of County Commissioners webpage. There will be find a, a link to register. If you're having any kind of problems being able to register or can't find that link, please call 407-665-0808. We will take public comment on each item as it appears on the agenda. In order to be recognized to speak, if you're using a computer or iPad, you will need to use the raise hand feature. If you're calling in on a telephone, you will need to press star nine. With that said, we're going to uh, move to Reverend Bob Melhorn from the Integrity Church Orlando to lead us in prayer and Pledge of Allegiance will then be done by um, Commissioner Lockhart. Very good, good morning, everyone. Let's be in prayer. Holy One, maker of heaven and earth, author of life, lover of our souls. We praise you and bless you. It has been your good pleasure to call us out of solitude into communities with all the joys and frustrations that they hold. And it is your good pleasure as well to raise up leaders to seek the welfare of the cities in which you have placed all of us. We thank you, Father, for those who have accepted the great challenge to serve as commissioners in Seminole County today. And we ask for them visit vision and wisdom. Some of them have uh, have um, much to take under advisement today. There are matters before them great and um, some matters that are routine. There are some decisions that will evoke passionate responses and others that will be met with indifference. But in all things, Father, we ask that you would guide, guide these commissioners in seeking the welfare of all in their jurisdiction with a special sense of mercy for all who need a an extra measure of grace today. And these things we ask in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor uh, Melhorn. Ms. Lockhart, we're now leaving. You're welcome. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, liberty. liberty Justice. Thank you, Commissioner Lockhart. All right, now we're going to move to Alan Harris, our emergency management director, who is going to update us on several topics. Uh, do we have Mr. Harris on the line? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Alan Harris, uh, Chief Administrator for the Office of Emergency Management. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uh, calling you. I just have to, had to leave a testing site. Uh, we were opening a testing facility at uh, Sanford Middle School. Uh, we're opening up some pop-up sites uh, throughout the community. So we just wanted to make sure they were all set up for today. Um, I appreciate you uh, giving me a moment to talk about uh, things that are going on uh, around the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, the first thing uh, we need to talk about, of course, is hurricane season, uh, of course, started earlier uh, last week. And uh, we already had our first experience of a tropical event, and that was trop uh, Tropical Storm Cristobal. Uh, that, exp that experience uh, was uh, pretty bad for Orange County, of course. They experienced an EF1 tornado in the downtown, just outside the downtown area of Orlando, with winds up to 105 miles per hour. Here in Seminole County, uh, we did experience some ex uh, extremely strong uh, storm front uh, winds as the uh, storm bands went through the area. Uh, we experienced some major power outage throughout the community uh, over the Saturday night, uh, early Sunday morning time frame. Uh, we were very blessed. Uh, the only uh, tornadic type experience was a water spout 
which was in Lake Monroe, but it never made it on land, so it never actually became a tornado. It was just a water spout. Uh, we did experience some damage uh, from the storms. Uh, the lightning struck one of our power sites uh, for our first responders, so we did have uh, some uh, minor disruption uh, with some communication systems, uh, but those were able to be completely repaired uh, by uh, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, and everything uh, was back to normal. Uh, we did, of course, lose some equipment uh, from that lightning strike that has all been replaced at this time. Uh, the second thing that we are, uh, oh, and I uh, need to mention, uh, this week we are uh, doing our virtual Hurricane Expo. One of the most exciting parts of my job is to do a Hurricane Expo. Normally we do those in malls and shopping plazas. We get to meet with citizens and communicate with them. They get to ask us questions. It's just a great time for us to communicate with uh, our residents. Unfortunately, we can't do that in person, so we tried to do it uh, the best way that we know how, and that's virtually. Uh, so at prepareseminal.org, not only do we have COVID-19 information, but now we have information related to the Hurricane Expo. Uh, there's videos there that you can watch on how to prepare for the hurricane season. And each day at 1230, we are doing a, uh, a lunch and learn uh, with one of our emergency management team members. Uh, talking about various ways to get prepared for the hurricane season. Second thing I'd like to update you on is the free uh, speech events that are taking place across the county uh, due to the tragic death of George Floyd. Uh, there have been uh, some extremely peaceful and respective events uh, throughout our community. One week ago, there was a march and prayer uh, in the downtown Sanford area. Approximately a week ago, there was also a march uh, in the city of Altamont Springs. Uh, that ended with a uh, with prayers and songs in front of City Hall. Uh, there uh, was another event uh, last Saturday at the Oviedo on the Park. Uh, that was also very peaceful prayers and songs, uh, uh, a peaceful tribute to George Floyd. There are a couple planned for this weekend, uh, one in the city of Oviedo and one in the city of Lake Mary. Uh, both uh, event organizers are working uh, with the municipalities uh, for a, a peaceful event. On the COVID front, uh, COVID-19 cases have bumped up uh, over the last weekend. Uh, if you've been watching the dashboard, we had over 30 new cases over the weekend. Uh, that is uh, relative, um, relatively high, some of the higher numbers that we've seen during the entire event. Um, last, uh, last time I was with you, we had about 80 people that were isolated and quarantined in their home. Uh, we now have over 200 that are isolated and quarantined in their home. So, uh, a relatively uh, significant bump, but uh, the one good thing is hospitalizations remain constant. Uh, so that number continues to be relatively low. Uh, so that's a good sign. Uh, so while the numbers are uh, going up, um, you know, we anticipate some of that uh, with uh, people getting back together that, that it was going to go up. Uh, we haven't seen a significant increase, but we have seen an increase. And that just reminds us that we need to continue the social distancing practices, uh, facial coverings, face masks, things like that to prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19. Uh, today, as I said, uh, we have a pop-up site at Sanford Middle School, and tomorrow we have a pop-up site at the Winter Spring Senior Center. Both of those facilities will be open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for individuals that want to be tested. Our Citizens Information Hotline, of course, is staffed Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 for anyone that has questions related to COVID-19. And that ends my report. Any questions? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Alan, very much. And thank you and all your staff for your continued diligence during so many now uh, different things going on that you have to be prepared for. Uh, on the COVID front, um, what percentage of positivity are we running now compared to when this first started? So uh, the number of tests, we're doing a lot more testing. So the, the positivity rate coming back is around 2.7%. We were averaging about 10%. So now what's the difference? The 10% is uh, at that point in time, we were only testing sick people. Now we're testing everyone. So anyone that wants to get a test can come get a test. So if you feel great, you uh, not don't even have a cough, you can go get a test if you want to, just for your well-being. And uh, of course, we under, we expected the percentage to go down a little bit. What is interesting is the cases over the weekend were not from these pop-up sites. So these are not individuals, most of them, 
are not individuals that feel well, that uh, just went through one of our pop-up sites. These are individuals that actually went to a, uh, a urgent care center or a hospital uh, with COVID type symptoms uh, and of course got a test and then came back positive. Great. Any other questions for Mr. Harris? Seeing none, thank you again very much, sir. We thank appreciate you. it. Um, on that note, I think it would be, we would be remiss not to recognize, I think we can all agree on the George Floyd incident in Minneapolis that what many of us have observed uh, was improper, uh, should never have happened. And, and I, I think we're going to see, you know, the law enforcement and justice ultimately be served. But I would ask that, uh, you know, we continue to interact with our faith-based leaders throughout the community. We encourage you know, peaceful assembly, um, and, and this kind of thing should never happen in our country, regardless of race, color, faith beliefs, and otherwise. Um, and I think that we all clearly understand that. So we thank the sheriff, we thank uh, Mr. Harris, we thank the faith-based leaders in our community who all continue to work together to make sure that uh, you know, this is not forgotten, as well as uh, do your peaceful protesting uh, an assembly, and many of us will be right there with you. So with that said, uh, any anyone else want to add anything to that from the commission? Seeing none. All right, let's move into our consent agenda. Uh, pursuant to Florida law, the public has a right to be heard on all propositions, except when the Board of County Commissioner is acting on ministerial or emergency matters or conducting a meeting exempt from Section 286.011 Florida statute. Public comment time on proposition shall be three minutes for individuals, six minutes for group representatives. The right to be heard during quasi-judicial hearings is governed by Florida law. The public will be provided the opportunity to be heard on non-agenda item matters at the end of the meeting. Proper decorum will be observed. County manager, are there any changes to your consent agenda? No, sir. Okay. If members of the public would like to make a comment and you're attending, the meeting is using a computer, iPad, or electronic device, please click on the raise hand feature. If you've called in using a telephone, you can raise your hand by pressing nine. You'll be called in the order you've raised your hand. Clint, do we have anybody from the public that wishes to comment on the consent agenda items two through 32? Uh, we do have one. Okay. Please state your name and address for the record and the item in which you're speaking about, and you will have three minutes to speak on that item. Who's being called? Ms. Bukite, you are up. Okay, I didn't hear my name. Sorry about that. Uh, this is Kim Bukite, 252 Spring Run Circle, Longwood. Um, little background, I'm a professional surveyor and mapper license in the state of Florida since 1990. And I just want to comment on item number 14, um, which has to do with new easements putting being put in place on some county properties. Um, I've owned and operated Bukit Associates Inc. Surveyors and Mappers since 1991. And my office was located in Altamont Springs in Center Point for 25 years until um, Emerson, the owner, started redeveloping, and recently I watched my office building being torn down. That was quite a sight. I'm still very much involved. My office is in Apopka, and I'm surveying all over Central Florida at various different times. So I got a little excited when I saw something on the agenda that uh, was in my field of expertise, and I think I can be helpful. So um, taking a look at those new easements which is item 14, if you wanna follow along. I did a cursory review as a courtesy, and um, I thought I was gonna have a little bit more time to write something up, but I'll just do this verbally. And here's a few uh, recommendations based on what I found from my review. Right now, I would re not recommend signing these documents as is until they're finalized. There's a couple little uh, glitchy things that should probably be fixed. And I recommend that you send them to the St. John's River Water Management District for revision on these few minor things. My screen went blank. Are you still hearing me? We're still hearing you, please. Okay. Proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Let me give you an example on the Geneva sketch, which you should see on the attachments to your packet. It's the last document, Exhibit A, Geneva sketch. So for example, and this is going to be really geeky. And only Ms. Bukite, maybe I could suggest, um, I, I understand you want to get technical, and, and most of us are not going to understand the technicalities of your profession. Um, oh, can you stop my time, please? Yeah, sure. You've got just okay. about a minute. Got about a minute remaining. So, okay. What I'm urging you to do is tell us what, you're, if you're in favor or not in favor, if you have a, a specific concern. I think what we're hearing is you have a concern that the surveys may not be accurate or not being considered in its totality. Um, but I don't know that each little point we're going to be able to follow. But please proceed. Right, right. I understand that. But as a courtesy, I'm letting you know that there are some errors, like, for instance, on page three of four of that exhibit A, the geometry in the legal description does not match the geometry in the parcel line table. And um, in the description, for instance, the line lengths are given as 20 feet. And in the parcel line table, they're given as 60 feet. And that could cause you a problem down the road. So I just wanted to make sure that that was addressed and corrected. I could see probably how that happened. Somebody did a cut and paste and then forgot to go back and edit in the right numbers. You know, that's a common error that happens. Um, but, you know, it's up to people like me, professional land surveyors, to have the eagle eye to catch those kind of things that you guys wouldn't normally catch. So I hope that's helpful. And, um, you know, I'm happy to get in touch with the survey division, the survey staff. I know they do a great job, so I can take it up with them and go over the details. I was really glad to see in the boilerplate language, number 15, that states that uh, 15C, that states that all ingress and egress shall use existing roads and trails. I was a little concerned that the water management district was just going to be able to ride all over creation out there without being limited in their uh, use of the roads. And also, there's something in the documents called managing agency, which Ms. is Bukai, not gonna be fine. Okay, well, I hope that's helpful. Have a great yes. day. Thank you, take care. Okay, well, I, I, I trust and, and hope that uh, we understand that our uh, professionals here at the county, as well as any surveyor that we would hire uh, interacting on such matters, including with other government agencies, uh, that would be reviewed in depth and uh, uh, done appropriately. Commissioner Kerry? Well, so is there a time sensitivity to the item? Because honestly, you know, having been in the engineering surveying business for years, the errors can occur and it does sometimes cause issues when your legal description isn't exact because it is an exact science to that and I'm sure that it's been reviewed but maybe there is a mistake and if there is if it's not time sensitive let's just have it checked just to make sure it's right because once we approve it it'll get recorded and then trying to unwind that is a little bit of a issue um, so I don't know if this is time sensitive or not Ms. Gia you might be able to speak to that and uh, if it's not time sensitive, I'd just soon see it come back after somebody else on our staff has checked it. We can bring it back. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's go to our board on the consent agenda. Chairman, I have um, clarifying questions on items 10 through 13. So you want to pull 10 through 13, Commissioner yes. Lockhart? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Commissioner Constantine? Well, Mr. Chairman, if uh, we heard from the uh, public and if there's no one else to pull anything, I'm ready for a motion. Okay. Uh, we don't see anybody, but uh, let's go to Clint. Clint, do we have anybody else wishing to discuss? or make comment on the consent agenda? Oh, we, we do, uh, okay. Chair, two more hands. All right, if you can bring those in where we can see them. I don't have a name, but I have a caller. Caller, you're on. If you would state your name and address for the record, please. Hi, it's, it's Sam Hall in the County Survey Office, just uh, responding to Kim's comments. Okay, Sam, please uh, go ahead. 
Now, just to your, in relationship to your concern, I don't see the technical errors that Kim is, is calling out in her comments. Um, Tom Snow and I are sitting here looking at the documents now and they appear to be consistent and correct. And I did not get a, a sense from Kim as to whether or not she was intending to support the, you, you know, you all signing off on these documents or not. And so as it relates to that, it's still our position that the documents are appropriate to, to sign and move forward with the water management district. Okay. Any questions for this caller? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you very much, Clint. Bring our next uh, caller in, please. Okay, um, caller, you're on. We need your name and address for the record, please. Good morning. Hi, Commissioner. My name is. Yes. Good morning. Yes, sir. Please proceed. Hi. Uh, my name is Bill Hyde. I live at 2379 Audley Street in Oviedo. Um, I can't see everything here, but I am addressing the Enclave at Oviedo uh, application, and I'm asking that you decline uh, this resolution. Uh, unless Volusia County has made a change uh, since my last time I was here, I still say that their housing authority does not specifically permit the use of their bonds outside the county. I know there's somebody up there might not agree with me, but I do maintain that. Uh, further approval of this resolution will hurt the Seminole taxpayers due to the tax credits for this type of housing. Uh, this also impacts um, our school taxes. And uh, just look at what's happening with Oxford over there. I've been following that too. Uh, last, um, I I'm asking you to disapprove that because specifically this is, this is really a stab in the eye to my little community out here on Lake Hayes Road. Um, I don't know why, but some reason we, we're being punished here out here um, because you have in front of you, and I sent it to you, the plan to force our residents to change our driving habits just to placate this developer and FDOT. And I know everybody's saying, hey, it's not my fault. The staff says it, FDOT says it, we got to do this, you got to do this. But really the ball falls back onto this commission. The, the, those of you who voted for this essentially are responsible for, for this change that we are going to have to suffer in my neighborhood. Um, I mean, at least work with somebody and leave that intersection alone. There's no reason for this to be changed. Um, last, um, it's very sad to me, and, and I, I don't want to address this under public comments, but it's very sad having this meeting without the public being allowed to attend. Um, it seems okay for people, including elected officials, even mayors, to gather and do a little virtual virtue signaling, but it's not okay for us to meet our elected bodies face to face. Um, it, it makes it really hard for to give any credibility to your emergency orders when when it's okay to do one and not the other. I want to thank you for your time. And uh, by the way, it, it was difficult to call in for me because of you guys know why my hearing. Uh, uh, issues are, but the staff was incredibly helpful getting me on here with two phones and a television. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Uh, Clint, We, uh, Commissioner Kerry, you have a comment? Yeah, I just have a question. Um, I mean, it's item number 31, but as I read this, it's simply a resolution. It's, it's got to do with the Internal Revenue Code that would allow them to issue the housing bond. So can we have the legal department speak to that? Yes, Mr. Applegate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Carey is right. Uh, this is a statutory requirement, both under Florida statute and the IRS code. Uh, there is no obligation uh, committed to Orange or to Seminole County on this. Um, and our bond council um, prepared and approved uh, all of the documents. And the documents are very clear that there's, again, no commitment on the part and no obligation on the part of Seminole County. What right. you mean? Has, I just want to clarify, it doesn't have any impact to the taxpayers of Seminole County. That's correct. And, and it is Volusia County, not Orange County, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, any other comments or questions for council? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner Delari. Again, this is part of the first uh, consent agenda. It's part of the regular agenda uh, in the consent. Uh, I would like to have staff talk about that traffic intersection at the appropriate time. 
Okay, well, we can bring that up uh, maybe under your district report or uh, at the appropriate time. Well, I, I thought he was referring to item 31. Actually, the, the enclave is item 31. It is part of the consent agenda. Yes, it is. When we get to, thir when we get to 31, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to at least discuss that intersection. Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, so do you want to pull 31 for a discussion, Commissioner Delari? When we, it's, it's not under the uh, 2 through 38. Two through twenty-nine, it'll be actually coming up as an individual item. It's under the part of the consent agenda. Yeah, it's part of the consent agenda. <laughs> so, what's it's the flavor? The chairman, I would like to handle it. You want to? You want to carve them all out, or it's under the two through twenty-nine and carve out the rest? It's under the county attorney's re, uh, office report, so we'll be talking about it then. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Constantine. Uh, thank you. If there's no one else, I, yes, I, I, I think the Commissioner uh, Delori is correct. The consent agenda is 2 through 29. This is the county attorney's agenda, 30 and 31. We will be discussing that uh, at the appropriate time after we, we prove this. So I'm going to make a motion in light of also what the uh, serve our professional surveyors have indicated that their their analysis is correct, that we approve 2 through 29 with the exception of pulling uh, for questions 10, 11, 12, and 13. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second on the motion? Can I get clarification from the county manager on her opinion of what items actually, actually constitute the consent agenda before I would second that? Sure. Um, so there are there are three parts of the consent agenda. There's a county manager consent agenda. There's a county attorney consent agenda and portion of the consent agenda. And there is the constitutional officers portion of the consent agenda. Item 31 is a consent agenda item under the county attorney's office. But it is part of the, co of the consent agenda. You can take them all at one time. You do that sometimes. Sometimes you break them up by by county manager, county attorney, and constitutional officer. But item thirty number item number thirty one is part of the consent agenda. Okay, I'll be happy to second the motion. Okay. Clarification, okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. So it, the county manager said that there was no time sensitivity on item number fourteen, and I know what our surveyor said, but our attorney was shaking his head that yeah, we should probably just go back and double check it because once we approve it, it's going to get recorded as submitted and you know again if it's not time sensitive i'd just rather have it double checked before we do that so um that was item number 14. so friendly friendly amendment would you include item number 14 with your motion mr costing yes mr chairman i i did include 14 if you want to exclude 14 uh, for the sake of just being totally, um, you know, sure, uh, I have no problem with that if it's not time sensitive. Okay, so uh, two through twenty nine minus ten through fourteen. Secondary agrees. Okay, well, we've got everybody in agreement. Let's have a roll call. Commissioner Delari, aye. Lockhart, aye. Constantine, aye. Gary, aye. Zimbauer, aye. Okay, let's get on with item number 10. Well, I'd like to address all of these together as one, if possible, because they're all a part of our new um, process of, of doing cultural arts grants in the community. And I think it's fantastic um, and give staff a lot of kudos for taking this on. Um, one of the things that I, I think we need to take into account moving forward, whether it's a part of just a process that our um, department director would like to implement, or if it's an actual potential revision to the admin code. Several of these applications uh, require the involvement of another entity to, to deliver their service, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club or Seminole County Public Schools. Um, Steinway Pianos would be a great example. It's a phenomenal program that they have drafted that they plan to implement through the vehicle of the Seminole County Public School System. 
Um, I think that we need to have, as a part of the application process, confirmation that that vehicle knows that they're a part of the application and that they are consenting in some way, shape, or form to being um, part of the program. Um, we've got a couple of items in 10 through 13 where um, the school district, frankly, just was not aware that these programs were being plan to be implemented in their schools. So, um, and Mr. Durr and I have talked about it and, and Rick, you know, if you want to take a stab at it, I'd be happy to turn it over to you, but I just feel like from a, from a process position, we need to have there be some acknowledgement and understanding as a part of the application that all the participants are really participating. Mr. Durr. Good morning. For the record, Richard Durr, Leisure Services Director. Um, as you know, this is our inaugural year of running through this process, and we modeled the process off after a number of typical uh, processes in Central Florida. Uh, and we've noted that as we've gone through this, uh, both as a selection committee uh, and in reviewing these and then putting the, putting the contracts together, there may be some room for some improvement in the process. Um, one of the things that uh, Commissioner Lockhart just spoke of would be some type of acknowledgement from the group that is proposing these particular programs uh, that says they've had at a minimum conversations with the folks that they're partnering with in going forward. Um, we did stay in contact with all of these organizations during the COVID uh, crisis. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were still in on, on these programs as well. So that's another little wrinkle into this entire process. We kept the process going uh, and kept the conversations going and, and did this review actually while we were on, on the, uh, the stay at home order. So that being said, I think we've had probably a little bit of hiccups on the, the nonprofit side, but at the same time, um, we're, we'll be happy to look at improvements that we can make in this process to bring those forward to you. If they require a revision of the admin code to put those in place so that when we come back to you in October with uh, the new uh, next year's fiscal year's program, that we can have those in place uh, ahead of time and be able to hit the ground running. Okay. So, Commissioner Carey? Well, I mean, I think it's an excellent idea to have that confirmation, but like Steinway Piano, for example, I mean, they've had that program in place with the school board for a year or so. Um, no, I, I, I know that they've been doing so, the program for years. They have been donating and doing a type of programming, but what they are proposing in this grant is, is, is different and new. And, um, and you know, I, I think, again, I don't, you misinterpreted as it is that it is they the ideas and the planning sound wonderful um they just uh, until this point have not included the vehicle for which right. I think programming um and and i think it's very important that if and i understand this is a drawdown grant so they have to prove that they did the programming in order to receive the funds and that's that's i like that a lot but i think if we're going to allocate money to a program and and it hasn't even been solidified yet in terms of the partnership and you know then that money is tied up where it could be utilized for another organization perhaps that already has all of their ducks in a row um i i am i don't feel comfortable voting on a giving grant money to an organization for a program that is not even partially um complete it's a it's an idea at this point from my perspective from the conversations I've had and it's a lovely idea but I don't know that we distribute funds for for when there's only 50% of an idea come to fruition I'm just bringing it to your attention if the rest of the board is comfortable with it that's up to y'all let me make sure I understand real quick um, then I'll go back to Commissioner Kerry I want to make sure I understand Commissioner Lockhart are you indicating that on one or more of these grants that certain parties named have either not been made aware or have not committed uh, to, to be a part and parcel of this? Yes. I'm not sure I'm not, is, is that, I'm, so I'm following it, right? Yes, um, I, I gave Mr. Durr um, the information that I had that I was given in writing yesterday. Um, okay. so 
you know, it's not like coffee talk. I, I right. you know, I did my homework, but um, I just want to make sure that in these instances and especially moving forward, I love the idea of these organizations partnering and working with other organizations. Collaboration is essential, but I feel it is our responsibility to make sure that we have proof of some sort that that collaboration is agreed upon by all parties, not one party asking for the funds. Agreed. Okay. So, Thank you. Commissioner Carey. So, Mr. Durer, have you gone back, have you circled back with these other agencies that are supposed to be the vehicle for pushing these programs out to confirm if they're on board with this or not? Or does this need a little more time? Is this time sensitive? Can we continue this until the next meeting? Or is it just the item number 12 that um, involved the school board or another another party? I know some of these did not. I just It was at the beginning of the agenda that I read. And of course, we had 50 items on there to read. So um, Mr. Durr, have you, have you circled back around with, with the other parties involved with this? So we have circled back with each of the applicants uh, at this point. Um, it was not a requirement of the grant to provide some level of proof that they either have agreements in place or uh, or even have uh, who their contact is at this other um, this other agency that they would be doing business with. Um, so we would need to circle back with them and then track those down with their assistance to make sure those are in place. Again, this wasn't a requirement of the actual grant application. Um, okay. So this would be above and beyond that. Well, probably um, should only... be going forward. Probably should be a requirement going forward. It I mean, be. I would agree that that, and that's just a process. It doesn't, probably not the admin code doesn't have to be amended for us to have an application that includes that as part of the process. So, um, is for it- For clarification, uh, Commissioner Carey, items 10 and 11 both um, involve partnering with other entities. Yeah. 12 and 13 from my um, review do not yeah. appear to involve other entities. I get confirmation from that, of course, from Mr. Durr. So, you know, if, if we want to move forward with 12 and 13 and then let 10 and 11 come back. If that's, um, if Mr. Durr can confirm what, that that's my perception. That's mine as well. And, and quite honestly, the, the time sensitive part of this is, is this process was started initiated late, obviously in the fiscal year. So this is this fiscal year's dollars. Uh, and that's the only real timeline that we have at the moment is the expenditure of these funds as part of this year's budget. Uh, we would have a new program going forward in October. So that's that's kind of where we are on the timeline. So we have time. Yeah. All right. Commissioner Delari, your hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can speak for the uh, Steinway Piano Organization Society. I've gone to many of their presentations. They work with the uh, school teachers uh, in around Central Florida. Uh, it may not be time sensitive, uh, but I do know that they work with the individual teachers that recommend students to them. Uh, I wouldn't have a problem continuing the two of them that uh, we just need to get some feedback to make sure that uh, the organizations are uh, working with them. But uh, I'd like to at least move forward with the other two. And uh, we just need some acknowledgement that they're actually working with the teachers in that regard. Well, I think that's a really good point, Commissioner Delari, but I would I would ask that the acknowledgement not be necessarily with the teachers. Um, I would like there to be someone who is an admin in an administrative role because they are the ones who are responsible for accepting and distributing any type of funds or um, in kind contributions. Um, teachers are great. I love them. <laughs> uh, and they do a wonderful job, but I just think someone who has signatory authority should be the one that's acknowledging partnering on a grant. Agreed. Grant, in my opinion. So, so can we move 12 and 13 forward and then 10 and 11 come back? I'm fine with that. You want to make a motion for that? Do we have a motion? Okay. I didn't know if there was other conversation or not. Sorry. No, no. I, uh, I just wanted to just, just as a reminder as well that, that these are, they're being reimbursable. So they actually do need to prove that <laughs> the work has been done and completed before we would uh, reimburse them. But I understand exactly what you're saying ahead of time. Yeah. All right. So I would like to uh, make a motion that we approve items 12 and 13 on the consent agenda and have 10 and 11 come back to us 
um, at uh, the next available opportunity when um, proof of collaboration can be brought forward. Second. And a motion and second. Any further comment? We'll roll call the vote. Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Constantine? Aye. Zembauer, yes. Okay, that moves us on to item 14. Uh, 14 was, 14 was uh, your... already addressed. It's in the motion to be um, withheld and come back after staff has confirmed it. Uh, my, that's right. Got it. My apologies. Okay. Very well. That takes care of the consent agenda up to item 29. Now we'll go to the county attorney's agenda number 30 and 31. And of course, item 31 has already been spoken to from the public. Clint, do we have anybody in the public wishing to comment on items 30 and 31? Uh, there are no hands, sir. Okay, being no hands. Um, Mr. Applegate, is there any comments or input you desire on any of these items before we move forward? No, we already addressed 31. Uh, 30 is the approval of the home away uh, agreement, uh, tri-party agreement with the tax collector's office at home away. Um, Lynn Porter Carlton is I know on if there are any questions on that is pretty much a mirror agreement with Airbnb that we have um, and it's a good step forward for the county okay and you also had a uh, add-on item number 31a well yeah I want to get this on now so that um, uh, with everything else going on this is more of a ministerial action I sent an email out yesterday uh, requesting uh, that the county release um, mineral rights uh, through two deeds uh, that uh, the county released the property back in the 1950s. Uh, the Cushman Corporation uh, needs to get a closing done. Title company has refused to move forward on it until the mineral rights are released by the county. And uh, I sent those documents out to all of you yesterday and we request approval uh, to release the mineral rights on the properties. And I'll just read for the record because I know it's kind of a late notice on it. Uh, lots R, S, T, and U, Block 47, amended plat of Crystal Lake Shores. And lots H and I and North, one half of a vacated alley adjacent to South Block 47. And lots E, F, G, and Block 47, and a portion of the north one half vacated alley lying southland adjacent to said lots amended plat of Crystal Lake Shores. Okay. Do I get that? Any, any questions or comments from <laughs> the, the board? Commissioner Carey? So Brian, um, just for clarification on item 31, and I just went back oh. through it again, that has, there's nothing in there regarding the design or the road entry or any of that. This is strictly the bond documentation for the statute that the statute requires for this to be, um, have this type of funding, is that, that correct? That is correct. And under the statute and the IRS code, that's the approval or denial that you have to vote on here, nothing to do with the other items. Right. So the access points and all of those type of things that are that were brought up and the sketch that Mr. Hyde sent out is not up for approval in this particular item. That is correct. Okay. And again, the bond documents are very clear that uh, your okay. approval does not create any obligation on the part of Samuel County. Right. All right. Thank you. And to this notion that um, it impacts our taxpayers, can can you speak to that at all? I mean, how how is? I'm not sure I'm following what Mr. Hyde's thought process or how is that impacting our taxpayers? I I can't comment on that. I don't know how what he's referring to, but I can tell you that um, this is simply a matter required by the IRS code uh, and state statute. I mean, these are similar agreements that I've seen that 
you know, yeah. Orange County has and other counties have reciprocating agreements around the state. I mean, right. it's not uncommon. Right. That's, That's correct. correct. Mr. Right. Chairman, and I, they can't get this type of funding without there being a resolution in place. Is that correct, Bryant? That, that's correct. Yes. We, we've that's done many of these. The taxpayers of the county. It has strictly to do with Florida statute, IRS requirements for this type of funding. That's correct. And we may be doing more of these under current circumstances with the economy. Okay. Mr. Constantine? Um, well, I don't have a problem with documents as we're talking about with Volusia County. I think that the um, the concern that I had again is I think that was something that Commissioner uh, Delori mentioned and that is just the um, if, if we could have an update on the transportation plan there because I remember this particular project and we had certain conditions of the DOT and what they would do. So I'd like to know from someone uh, first of all are we approving anything? I think that it was just discussed that we are not approving anything that has to do with transportation, but I would like to have an update on that since it is no. for us in the agenda. That's right. And, and, and if it's okay, can we get a staff update off meeting? I mean, do you want to be briefed in your offices or um, I don't know the staff is prepared because this project is at what phase? I don't know. I mean, happy to do it, but uh, Commissioner Kerry? We can't hear you, Commissioner Kerry. Can't hear you. Uh, uh, once a zoning process is approved, the next process takes place. And so if there's an issue that a citizen has a concern about an access point or something else, I mean, the as I recall, when this was approved, there were certain requirements in the development order. And if so, if if they aren't being met, then staff needs to make sure that all of those are met because all the concerns were put on the table at the time we did the development order. So if the if there's a concern, in my opinion, about the access or what have you, then the district commissioner should maybe go talk to staff and just see what the see what's going on because item 31 has nothing to do with that. So Commissioner Delari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a district commissioner, I did vote against this during the zoning uh, meeting. Uh, the zoning meeting and the approval of the uh, revenue bonds are two separate issues. Uh, the Commissioner Kerry is right in the development order, as well as what uh, Commissioner Constantine said, there were certain requirements. Uh, under my district report, I plan on bringing this up. I don't think it's appropriate right now because it's a separate issue from bond financing. I believe that's correct, Brian Applegate. That is correct. That's what I've been trying to convey. I understand that. So if we can just stick to the issue at hand, which is the housing revenue bond, uh, I plan on voting for it because it's separate than the zoning issue. But under my district report, I plan on bringing up uh, Mr. Hyde's concerns. Thank you, Commissioner Delorean. I'll look for board action. Mr. Chairman, I move items 30, 31, 31A, and I'll go ahead and include 32, the clerk's expenditure report as part of my motion to move this meeting along. Thank you, Commissioner. We have a second. Second. Second, second Ms. Lockhart. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Commissioner Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Constantine? Aye. Zimbauer, yes. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Let's move on to um, a regular agenda item. We're gonna have a presentation, but let's read for the public. Item 33 will be presentations from two qualified firms for design build services for juvenile assessment center addition to the juvenile detention center services. Jamie Locklear, the purchasing and contracts manager will introduce the agenda item, provide instructions to the commissioners, and introduce the presenting firms. Ms. Locklear will keep time on the presentation to ensure fairness. Ms. Locklear. Good morning, commissioners. Mr. Chairman, can we have the all the other people on this that aren't talking mute their mics so we don't get that feedback? Yeah, if, if everybody would uh, try to remember to mute your mics and then unmute when you're ready to talk, be very helpful, thank you. I know it's hard, but by now we're all doing enough of these. We should be remembering. Okay, Ms. Locklear. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Okay, you must have, Ms. Locklear, if you would make sure all devices in your there office. Is that better? 
much. Thank um, you. This is the item for the design build project for the uh, juvenile assessment center addition to the juvenile detention center. This is the stage two presentations of the two firms that were qualified or deemed to be qualified by the evaluation committee back in December. Each of the firms will provide a 10 minute presentations and then will be available for 10 minutes of Q and A with the commissioners after their presentations. Once both uh, presentations have concluded, um, we will come back and I will get the rankings from each commissioner for tabulation and then read the final rankings for board discussion and a motion to approve or move forward with the project. Um, I will ask that between the two presentations that you give us just a couple of seconds because we've got to get one team out and then the other team in to maintain the social distancing. So we'll, we might go black for just a couple of minutes, but um, we're going to get it all uh, situated. Uh, Understood. Thank you. Are there any questions from the commissioners before we get started in the first presentation? Mr. Chairman? Uh, Commissioner Delari? Yes, first question I have, and it's not for, for the applicants, it's for our staff. The budgetary number that uh, everyone's looking at, when was that established and by who? My understanding is the budgetary number of the 3.6 was established by the grant that's associated with this project. And I've got um, John Dredge here, if you would like more information on that. Can you give me the date? of when that number was established? Uh, John Zrej, uh, Public Work Director for the record. Uh, we had that the project bid out before. And what we did, uh, the first bid, we took that number and also the, the, the second bid, we added some uh, a parking lot and some other issue. And based on that, last what we we came up with is three point six million dollar for the for the cost estimate for the project. And what was the what was the date of that? Uh, probably about six months or so. I can get to the exact date when we when we bid the first one. I don't I don't have it with me exactly, but I can okay. give you. The exact okay. day. Mr. Chairman, the, the, these were submitted back in November. I mean, this has been going on for a while. Our tabulations are dated November 13th. So, I mean, this probably goes back a while and, and uh, from the time it started. Um, I would agree. I think, I think this goes back much further than just a couple years. I think this goes back to at least uh, 2014, 2015 when discussions were initially being had. Of course, I wasn't here. Commissioner Kerry may be able to speak more directly to that. And Chairman, I, I, well, I think Ms. Guillet could speak to it because it is uh, it was grant funded because of the juvenile detention overpayment of $4 million um, by, the, by the county to the state. So Ms. Guillet, you want to speak to that? that Commissioner, that's correct. We started talking about this project several years ago, um, working in conjunction with the sheriff's office um, as one of the projects that we were advancing as a as a potential offset for um, the underpayment of the juvenile justice funds. Of course, we we've resolved that issue, but um, but we did go to the legislature several times attempting to get funding. Um, we got funding initially, was not enough to do the entire project, have been able to get that funding um, extended and it worked with the board last year to get money in the budget um, to have full funding for the project. So the, the 3.6 number has been a number that we've, we've been working with. Uh, I think we started, it was 2 million and it's kind of increased because there's been so much time since we initially started talking about this project. Um, and, it, and as John said, there have been some um, additional revisions to it. Um, this is really a, a facility that the sheriff's office will be working out of. Um, and so we've been working very closely with them to make sure that it meets their needs um, and accomplishes some of the really positive things that this project will accomplish, like consolidating resources into one building. So um, as you know, when we start on capital projects, we do an estimate um, sometimes Things come in higher, um, conditions change, but I, I think that's probably, um, it, it was our best working number at the time when we went out to bid, but it has been a project that's been in the works for a number of years. Commissioner Carey. And Ms. Gay, it's, it's in the budget for 3.6. 
Uh, at Korea. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think we've got something a little bit maybe closer to four. Yeah, I was going to say. I think, it's, I think it's around four. Um, but as indicated on the, um, I mean, we we all have the presentations both the for both of the consultants that are competing here, and our staff review of them is dated November eighteenth of twenty nineteen. So the comments that are in our agenda item. So, so even the process, I'm sure it's been delayed because of all the COVID stuff and all the other stuff going on, but I mean, it's, so it's got some time lingering there, but it, it, it's got some age on it. <laughs> right. All right. Any, anyone else from the commission have any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Dredge. Okay. Ms. Locklear, you're back up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the presentations are going to be in alphabetical order from the two firms. Um, the first up is the collage companies. I'm going to turn it over to them and they'll have 10 minutes to present. And then um, you can start your Q&A for them and I'll turn it over to them at this time. Thank you. Welcome. Please begin when you're ready. And please state your name and address for the record, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rob Mafis. I'm COO of the Collage Companies, 585 Technology Park, Lake Mary, Florida. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come in and present to you today. Even though it's virtual, even though we're remote, um, we really appreciate it. Our team of Collage, Scott and Cormia, Tricubed, IBC, and TLC are all either here, social distancing here in the conference room, or available remotely. Um, as needed during Q&A. We have a lot of information to share with you during this 10-minute uh, presentation, so we're just going to scratch the surface of it, quite frankly. And we have um, really a, a local team with a proven history of having done a tremendous amount of work uh, to prepare for, for this. We, um, this is the same team that of uh, designers and builders who recently completed the uh, Shepherd's Hope project. We also finished the Teen Challenge project right here in Sanford. And the same team of Collage and Scott completed the original Juvenile Justice Center. So it also, not only the, the team of companies, but many of the same individuals. So that, that project, the Juvenile Justice Center, was completed back in 2003. This is the same team that was selected back in 2018 as your design builder for this project. So we have a, a tremendous amount of information, not only from the time that we've been involved with it during this go-round, but from our previous efforts as well. So those past two years, we've been able to expand really on our understanding of how to best serve the needs of Seminole County, the Sheriff's Office, and specifically the Juvenile Justice Division. We have an unmatched uh, approach and knowledge of the design-build process. It's design-build done right. It is that uh, melding of design and construction, a proven approach, and really it's part of the reason why we were chosen back in 2018 to do this project. Obviously through this process we haven't been able to fully engage with staff. So what we've been able to do is take the design criteria that was uh, well established and produce a design and construction solution that accomplishes the design criteria and also limits impact on the existing facility. And we look forward to the opportunity to further refine that approach <laughs> when the time comes uh, to fully engage with staff. So you're going to hear briefly, briefly from our architectural team members and MEP team members. And again, our uh, entire design team is available during Q&A. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Angel Ortiz, 1126 Cambridge Road. I'm the architect from Scott Cormia. And as the architect from our team, our strategy for this project was to start with a holistic design approach in terms of integrating the new JAC building with the existing JDC, while at the same time, making sure this new juvenile assessment center has a fresh and exciting new architectural aesthetic. We also wanted to make sure both buildings work together cohesively in terms of circulation, flow, functionality, and most importantly, security. 
So with that being said, uh, we would like to present a 3D video walkthrough of the new building. To give, so as we fly in from the north, the first thing you will notice is the facade design. We want a simple, clean stucco finish, utilizing scoring reveals in order to create a contemporary pattern of colors. As we enter the building, you are greeted with a lobby reception area, which we updated into a more open concept floor plan. Additionally, since we had a chance to relook at the plan, we wanted to take the current COVID pandemic into consideration, making sure that building users have enough space and flexibility to practice safe social distancing. For that reason, we made sure to separate the office space from the lobby area and brought in storefront glass to allow for transparency between the office workers and incoming visitors. We really like the idea of having open air workstations and make sure to set aside two larger private offices for management. The benefit to an open concept workspace is that it allows for a larger degree of flexibility in terms of organizing space and workstations. From the office, we can move into the secure vestibule that leads us into the cell room area. As you walk in, the control room is located to your right and you have a combination of cell rooms and security offices to surround a large open space. From there, we can exit this area via a secure corridor of the, um, for the existing juvenile detention center. This corridor also serves as a buffer between the two buildings and houses a lowered roof area to allow for water drainage from the existing roof to be transferred to the new roof. This secure building, this secure corridor buffer can also be utilized to minimize disruptions during construction. The inmates can then be transferred from this corridor into the existing dining hall of the JDC for further processing. Now for the structural component of the design, we work closely with Hassan O'Rory from IBC Engineering for the one-story hardened masonry shell, which is composed of load-bearing masonry block walls around the perimeter and reinforced masonry interior partitions in the secure portions of the building. Additionally, a roof framing system composed of long span open web steel joists is supported by interior steel columns, which will be hidden in non-bearing partition walls. The structural design is done in full coordination with the project design team, with the main points of consideration being budget, schedule, and efficiency of design. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Gary Kruger with TLC Engineering Solutions, 7370 Cabot Court, Melbourne, uh, Florida. Uh, for the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, our design approach uh, offers some distinct advantages by consolidating the building systems to better serve both the new and existing facility. We propose to relocate the fire alarm, the fire riser to the new building. We also plan to introduce a new energy efficient water heater that will serve both the new and existing building. We, are, we plan to, to remove the existing FPL transformer, which is located in the footprint of the proposed addition. Uh, and introduce a new transformer uh, with FBL and also coordinate that to minimize the downtime in the existing facility. We also have new energy efficient rooftop uh, HVAC air handler units that will serve the new building. And a key consideration is VAV boxes, which will allow customized control for temperature for your dedicated spaces for, for office areas, common areas, and conference rooms. We'll also introduce uh, filtration to, to address the COVID concerns would also entertain the, the discussion regarding ultraviolet considerations, which have shown proven and effective for COVID situations. Um, we propose a new generator. We have a very uh, efficient uh, generator design. We looked at the 12 year actual energy use for the building, which allowed us to refine and reduce and right size the generator design for the building. In our walkthroughs, we also became familiar with an issue where the uh, panels would trip uh, when the generator was engaged, that issue will be addressed with the new generator design. So suffice to say that we've spent a great deal of information or a great deal of time gathering the information needed for this facility. And we, it includes our civil work that we've done. And Connie Silver with TriCube has put together a great plan to address the existing conditions and make sure that we're addressing all of those proposed utilities. The stormwater management, which is so key to this, as you know, I mean, that area can get very wet, so uh, she's addressed the stormwater management aspects as well. We've also included during that site analysis a solid approach to the coordinated effort of construction, allowing the logistics plan to meld perfectly with the ongoing operations of the existing facility, safety and security being paramount, making sure that we're maintaining those egress requirements from the existing facility. We know the importance of budget. And from a budgetary standpoint, as, as we've talked about, it's very important to be good custodians of the taxpayer dollar. And we've worked hard to provide a prudent 
economical design, that budget uh, elements of the project are very important. And the estimate that we've included includes uh, Seminole County trade contractors, and we've adapted our 2018 proposal, that same proposal that we were selected on back in 2018 to make sure that we've included those new items that are incorporated. And we've also taken into consideration the COVID-19 related impacts into our budget. We're certainly available to further evaluate this budget as we have a chance to roll up our sleeves and sit down with staff on the project. Now, speaking of COVID-19, that's obviously had an impact on the timeline for the project. So we know the importance of those critical time elements as it relates to the grant. Our detailed schedule allows us to incorporate those timelines, those aspects of, of the project that are needed for uh, grant approval. And then our schedule also includes the opportunity for early completion. In fact, the, the schedule shows an, an opportunity to move forward with the design and permitting elements early, allowing for a potential earlier completion of, of, of three months advancement in the schedule. So the bottom line, as we stand here before you with the collage team, is that we bring the capabilities and the understanding, the approach necessary for this project, necessary for design build to be done right. It's the approach to seamlessly meld the design and construction elements into the project. It's what staff was looking for in 2018 and why we were selected. The project is very important to our team. That's why we've continued to stay engaged. We know it's an important project for the Sheriff's Office. We know it's an important project for the Juvenile Justice Division. And that's why we've continued, even with the multitude of hurdles over the last two and a half years, to remain engaged. So with that, we look forward to really rolling up our sleeves and getting the project moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, as soon as staff gets our screen back where I can see everyone, I think we'll probably go to So commissioners, do you have any questions for the presenters? Yes, so Commissioner Carey. So in your presentation, you've said several times we were chosen, we were selected. So you were shortlisted to go to phase two. Is that what you meant by that? No, when the project was originally or previously uh, uh, advertised back in 2017 there was a selection process in 2018 and collage was ranked first in that process for final selection shortlisted to go to phase two which is this presentation correct uh, no ma'am there was a previous process in 2017 where we went through the complete selection process phase one and phase two we had a presentation that was in 2018 i think it was march maybe April of 2018. And during that process, uh, collage was selected for the project. Okay, so now I have a question for staff. So was that a process that they went through for a staff selection? No, the board selected them, but we didn't have, we, um, if you'll recall, we, didn't, we, did, funding. we didn't have the funding. So okay. we got, we've got funding and we had to start over again though because so much time had elapsed. Okay, so I, I was just trying to figure out how we got back here. Okay, and then in your schedule, um, I noticed on the first page in your uh, presentation book, you've got uh, August uh, 29 of 2021. And in your timeline, actual schedule, it says July, but it starts in March. So is your everybody's schedule just going to be kind of pushed out three or four months from where you started? We did because of the process of design, the actual design, once we have the ability to sit down and go through the design and permitting process. And then we, as I mentioned in the presentation, we've had the ability to kind of hit the ground running and fast track some of the elements of the project to allow us to finish sooner than the 517 days that's advertised. The current RFP has a 517 plus 30 day timeline. And, and uh, our approach would be to move forward with a lot of that early work. And that means procurement of the generators, a lot of the, or the generator, a lot of the elements potentially for stormwater management that are so important. All right, and then in your, um, your estimate for this project now, was in 2018, uh, what was your estimate in 2018? Well, good question. It was, 
3.3 million. Okay, and today it's th almost 3.6? Yes, 3 million 527. That's all I have. Uh, yeah, I got 3,579,473, so almost 3.6. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Commissioner Delari. Commissioner Delari, you're, 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 you're muted. Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, question for staff first. Is this facility supposed to remain operational during construction, or is the entire facility going down? Uh, Commissioner, it this will remain is a, operational. We coordinated with the sheriff staff and uh, it will remain operational. Commissioner, they're relocating the building. So the existing building will remain operational while they construct the new the new building adjacent to the um, the detention center. The reason why I'm asking the question is I've not heard the applicant yet discuss anything regarding to keeping part of the facility operational uh, from a security standpoint, from an electrical standpoint, and from an electronic standpoint. I'd like for them to, if possible, address that and how, from a security standpoint, they're gonna be allowing these two facilities to operate at the same time. Right. Or the two facilities to operate at the same time. So it, it, as was included in our phase two documents, we have a logistics plan that shows our, our outline in the construction confines. You're absolutely right. It's paramount that we maintain the safety and security of the existing and fully operational facility. We know that it runs 24 hours a day and that we need to keep it operational. The area that is um, outlined for the site is to the north of the existing detention facility. It's a perfect area for us to carve out and keep separate from the continued operation of the detention center. There is an exit and means of egress on the north side that walks through. In fact, in our virtual walkthrough, you saw the area that was the cafeteria. That cafeteria has a means of egress. That is the only area that is really near the, the, the uh, construction zone. And we have fencing that separates the area of construction from that egress. So that everything that is uh, happening from the standpoint of the Sally Port on the north side of the existing facility to the entrance on the south side of the existing facility continues to remain operational. We are building this facility in the, call it the greenfield area that is just north of the existing facility. And then from the standpoint of the MEP that you asked for, I have Gary Kruger address that. Yeah, one of the primary considerations, and we did mention this, is the electrical service to the building. So we do plan to bring in a new service, a new transformer that will be fully operational. We'll be able then just to minimize the downtime for the existing facility to tie into that new system. All the MEP systems have been designed this way, where it's all transitional, a short period of downtime, transition into the new uh, infrastructure that will support both the new and existing building. And one additional item from the standpoint of the structure, we've kept the structure completely independent of the existing. It's for a number of reasons. First and foremost, to maintain the continued operation of that existing facility, but also there's a rainwater, uh, the, the roofing elements that are so needed, We've kept that separate. We've also kept the secure corridor on the north side of the existing facility so that we can build everything that's needed from a structural standpoint independent of the existing. Okay. Any other questions, Commissioner Lockhart? Thank you. Um, so who at the Sheriff's Office or who in terms of operation of the current facility have you um, talked with at all about whether or not what you're proposing is going to be um, workable with the way they run the facility? All we've been able to do because of the cone of silence has really been able to engage with purchasing and, and make sure that we have addressed all of the requirements of the design criteria. The design criteria is pretty robust from the standpoint of outlining the, the particular elements of the sheriff's office, the detention facility requirements and making sure that we are from a design standpoint and a construction standpoint, keeping things operational. But that's the, the, the point that I was making during the presentation is that we really, a lot of what we've done, we've been forced to do it in a vacuum because, you know, of the, the, the cone of silence and the inability to really sit down with uh, sheriff's office and the detention facility folks, other than during the pre-proposal meetings and our looking at the existing facility during the, the several walkthroughs back in 2017, 2018, and then, of course, in this go-round. 
Okay, so you you had a an opportunity at some point in time before the cone of silence went into place to gather operational standards. This is you, right? I mean, at some point yes, in time. Yes, we did. Up, and, right? and and the and the plan that is being proposed this time is the same plan that was approved by staff, and that's you know the reason we were selected back in 2018. So we're very confident that from a both on a construction side, logistics and our approach to where we would stage materials and approach the project. And then on the design side, how we would interconnect with the existing facility is appropriate. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. I do have some questions. Um, your, your price proposal, does it include all four addendums, yes, including it does. those addendums in 2020? Yes, it does. It includes all of the addenda that were part of this procurement. Okay. Um, the other question I have is during the presentation, there were in this sort of tales on on um, Mr. Lockhart's questions. Um, a couple of things were stated: weren't fully able to engage with staff. Uh, you need to further refine. Um, so, what I need to know is, and I think you just answered a moment ago: Do you have enough information uh, that you're confident? With the presentation that you've provided us that uh, you've got any and all information you need for this deal to get done we are very confident confident from the standpoint of the design criteria that was published and it and it tells us in the rfp you know who, who to limit our contact to the multitude of walkthroughs that we've had in the facility both again back in 2017 and 2018 and then in this go round um, so we're very confident and our knowledge of this facility and that the approach that we're providing is going to be uh, the, the best approach and make this project successful. Okay, and one final question. Um, on your price schedule, um, on the design builder items one and two uh, related to the portable buildings? Yes. Um, your entry is uh, includes non applicable for, for uh, RTB part four, section G, uh, then it, number two says included in the RTB section, uh, part four, section G. Can you explain that so everybody understands that? Sure, I'm gonna let Keith Kolakowski, our, our uh, chief estimator for the project, handle that. Hi, good morning. Yes, uh, we, we uh, had, there were some clarifications that had to be made uh, when we submitted our proposal. We do, in fact, include all the work related to the portable building. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's absolutely part and parcel to this comprehensive design build estimate. Um, and one more thing I, I wanted to note, you know, when we talk about not having yet fully engaged with the staff, that's appropriate because this is a design build solicitation. So that, uh, those conversations are intended to happen uh, within the context of the design build uh, process. So we're very excited to engage with the staff. Uh, that also allows us some opportunities to dig into value engineering and making sure, you know, when we talk about putting an estimate together that is stewarding the public dollars appropriately, it's not just a one-time snapshot where we say this is the number. Uh, it, it's it's really a process of continuing to refine and dig into you know, the materials that we're selecting for finishes, making sure the systems are designed efficiently in terms of, you know, their performance, but also in terms of their cost, that we're not, you know, excessively um, putting things in without reviewing them through that, uh, you know, design early work process, so. So, okay. so sure, and I fully understand that. So that brings up another question. Um, I mean, you, you all do this, this is your profession. This this is what you all do every day, all day long. Yes, sir. In, in review and in, in the information you've gathered now, uh, in your expert opinion, do you perceive that there is going to be significant changes, either in materials or work, uh, once you do engage with staff? I mean, you've built facilities similar to this before, and as a professional, I mean, have you seen some shortfalls either that you've been provided or access that you would be able to say, well, you know, this is our best shot at it, but you know, the reality is, uh, you know, we may have to come back for a change order here and there. 
Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, no, I, I'm so glad that you asked that question. So one of, the, one of the things that we do and that we've done in this instance is back in 2018, we solicited the subcontractor market. We sent our preliminary design documents to them and we said, hey guys, take a look at this and you know, give us your pricing input. What's going on in the market right now? So we've engaged again here in 20, 2020, just recently here, a snapshot of the actual market costs that are going on. You know, we have a number uh, from Miller Electric, who is the specified electrician for some of the uh, IT systems and security systems that are required for this to integrate into the existing facility. So those are, those are you know, uh, strong numbers from, from knowledgeable contractors in the market today. Uh, we did not cook up these numbers in a lab and just kind of crossing our fingers. Um, uh, uh, so we definitely feel a level of confidence. There's you know, been input on, on concrete and steel and structures. So, um, I will say that we, we've seen a lot of volatility in the market over the last couple of years, as, as you all are very aware of, um, but we are tracking these things in real time. And so I, I, I heard earlier there was a concern, well, how early was this budget established? You know, this, this, this project is coming in around $380 a square foot in terms of construction costs. That's appropriate. That's ample for this type of a project. And, and, uh, and so I, I hope you have confidence that this budget as a, you know, if this was a hard bid, it would have been, it would have been a much lower number than what you're seeing right now uh, from us and, and, and from our, you know, uh, competitors or, you know, uh, so a design build number is naturally a little bit larger because of the level of risk and uncertainty that we enter the process. But we're very confident that this is, this is a manageable uh, budget. Sure. To achieve this, the quality of the facility that you want and in the time frame that you need it. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner Carey. Follow up to that. Say, if the same gentleman would stay there. So um, you said this is coming in at 380 a square foot? Yes. Okay. And that's what your estimate is based on? Yeah, that, that's construction costs. However, if you take design and construction, we're closer right. to four hundred and twenty dollars a square foot. Okay. So if you take three point six million divided by eighty six hundred square feet, about. Yeah. Um, but the actual construction cost, no, no design, uh, is more around three point three. For this. Okay. And I have a question for staff, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay. So I'm, you know, I'm looking at all the documents that I have, and I have their proposal here, and <clears throat> under section eight. They, they have, this is how they have theirs put together, required forms. It says that the price proposal breakdown is in here, but it's not in my book. Um, so, anybody else got that? Nope. I didn't the breakdown either. No, I don't, I don't okay. either. All right, well, I just, I just thought <laughs> maybe I got a book that didn't have is, in it, but. Uh, when, when we, when we select, when you select the, the contractors that we will submit a breakdown for uh, uh, item for for construction for the purpose of uh, billing. That's what. Well, I know that wh whoever is selected, you're obviously going to do some negotiating. And then when you get into the process itself, mm -hmm. talk, start talking about materials and what have you. And you're, you know, if you're estimates start coming in higher than you were anticipating, then you're going to, you know, start value engineering it to get your cost back down. I get that before you get to a final not to exceed number. But I look at the other proposal and there is actually a price proposal as a required document in, it was a required document, it's in the proposal. So my question again is for staff as to does staff have this document? Because it, I believe it was a required document based on the RFP, and I don't, I just don't see it. So I'm, I'm asking the question. Which document are you talking to? I'm talking about the uh, DB 2785-19 RTB price schedule. Commissioner Carey, mine was inserted afterward. I, I'm sorry, it, I had it, but it was not included in the ringed binder. It was 
<laughs> well, we, we have that, but we don't have a complete price breakdown. I think it's what Commissioner Kerry is asking for. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I received it. Did everybody get these two yes. documents yes. with the collage? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, maybe I stuck them somewhere else because I've had these for so long and moved them around a couple of times. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. All right. I just wanted to clarify. Thank yeah. you. Comm Commissioner Delari. Thank you. I have a question for the applicant's uh, uh, estimator. So, so normally, and I'm going uh, pre-COVID-19 because uh, during COVID-19 and after COVID-19, things are definitely different. But prior to COVID-19, I can tell you in the construction industry, people are lucky to hold their prices 30 days and you're telling me you've held prices over a year well it's part of the blessing of uh, uh uh if this was a hard bid i would say absolutely not the number would not hold but uh but the nature the nature of these numbers is that uh there there is naturally cushion in design build but um that's that's probably the smaller portion of it i would say that uh the no the the number has not been held for a year um when 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 the new solicitation came out there were several scope items that caused the you know the, the generator was upgraded to cover both both the new facility and the entire old facility and the lift station there was a parking lot and parking lot lighting that was added. Um, and there were uh, access control requirements that were, I mean, very expensive to do that, to tie that into the existing system. So not only did we add those costs, but we also adjusted our 20, 2018 pricing uh, to, to match the current market. So uh, the, the number that we are carrying is, is, is very much up to date. Uh, so, so, um, on the one hand, d d design build wouldn't have, you know, caused the number to jump so starkly because we can we can look at those things and and kind of talk through them. There's opportunity there, but uh, to answer your question, <laughs> the the number is accurate for today, um, and uh, and it has gone up. Absolutely, it's gone up. Because so. I can tell you, on an annual basis, construction costs at a bare minimum will go up at least eight percent at least yeah and if the price was determined a couple of years ago however many years back it should at least go up the cost of uh, inflation or general construction costs for inflation is eight percent and then you have the volatility of the market which is another factor and i can tell you pre covid 19 people are lucky to hold their prices for at least 30 days so Thank I'm sorry, if I, if I may, the, the price proposal that we submitted was submitted in March of 2020. Okay. So just to clarify that, so yes, it was not it, it was not a year ago to, what we did was when we submitted our price proposal for the 2017, 2018 procurement, we reevaluated that for this newer procurement and, and the price proposal, the stage two submissions were in March of this year. So it hasn't, it has not been a year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other inquiries of this applicant or staff on this applicant's proposal? Seeing none. Okay, Ms. Locklear, thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, maybe we could take a break to give her a minute, just take a five minute break and give her a minute to get the next group up. It's 1058. Let's, uh, let's make sure we're back here by 11. Oh five. Yes, sir. We'll be back and ready.
No, no worries. Okay, looks like uh, we're all here, Miss Locklear. If you would be kind enough, is the applicant ready? We're working out just a couple of little technical difficulties and we'll be ready momentarily. Do you need more time? Um, maybe just a minute or so. Okay. That's perfect. Thank you. I need to go add sugar. <laughs> <laughs> that was well timed, Jamie. Well timed. <laughs> That'll stop you from sharing. Mm -hmm. I stopped sharing. So you're not going to need this. Okay, commissioners, if you're ready, we're ready to start. All right, wait uh, one moment. We're waiting on Commissioner Lockhart. Okay. Okay, we're good to go. So this is the presentation from the other qualified firm that was um, evaluated and reviewed by staff in the initial evaluation. They're, uh, they're Wharton Smith. They're gonna do a 10 minute presentation and then follow up with question and answers, same way with the first firm and I'll turn it over to them now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. And make sure make sure that the presenters state their name and address for the record as each one of them come in and out, please. Mr. Chairman, it sounds like they may also have the TV on in their um, in their wherever they're at presenting. So let's make sure that they don't, because I was as soon as somebody was talking, I heard the feedback starting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> If 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 y'all could just make sure everything is muted except for the presenter's microphone, um, that would be very helpful. Can, can y'all hear me now? We can. Okay, thanks. Can you also see our presentation? Yep. Got we, it. We, we can see. We just need name and address for the record. Wouldn't you start, please? Okay. My name is Rick Bundy. I'm a project executive for Wharton Smith, address 750 Monroe Road, Sanford, Florida. Um, first of all, I want to appreciate and thank the selection committee for allowing us to interview for you today to be your design builder for the Juvenile Assessment Center edition at the Juvenile Detention Center facility. Next slide. <laughs> the team we have assembled is HKS will be our lead architect firm. And then our sub consultants will be CPH, our civil engineer, our structural engineer will be BBM. And our mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection engineer will be Matern. The staff that we have assembled is uh, Ray Bone will be the project manager. Um, and we have John James will be our superintendent out on site. And for our design team, we'll have Nathan Butler, our project director, our lead architect, and then Andy Duffy will be our free construction service uh, manager um, assessing all the free con uh, and estimate portions of the project. A little bit about Wharton Smith and HKS. You know, Wharton Smith was founded and is headquartered here in Sanford, in Sanford Florida since 1985. Uh, Wharton Smith and HKS has, has successfully completed three projects for Seminole County, two of which were Boombaugh Sports Complexes, which I personally was the project manager working with Nate and Buffler and uh, John James, our superintendent, on those projects. HKS has designed almost a million square feet of Justice Juvenile facilities. 
And uh, Warren Smith, we are currently, or we have been for the past three years, working with Osceola County on one of their current facilities off Simpson Road, Osceola Jail. So we know what it takes to work on, on a um, occupied uh, juvenile campus. Our understanding of this project, you know, we know it's an 8,620 square foot addition to the existing juvenile detention center. Um, includes site improvements, drainage, parking, lighting, and security. Um, it's a selective renovation alteration to the existing facility. And we do understand the value of the availability that it's the Department of Juvenile Justice grant funding. Safety is one of our biggest concerns here at Ward Smith. You know, it's all about separation, the, the work and the work areas. Um, all our supervisory, our, our, our safety managers are um, OSHA certified that visit the jobs at least twice a week um, to make sure that they are doing what they need to be doing. COVID, um, you know, this has been a, a huge change in our business. You know, we are an essential business, so we had to you know, look at some different procedures to go through on our act, once we're on a project, in our active project, not only in our offices and what we're doing today, uh, hence doing the virtual presentation, but uh, all of our workers on our projects, you know, as you can see in the photos, they get um, their temperatures checked every morning. They get a slip that says everything, they're good to go. We've gotten creative with hand washing stations, you know, going to Home Depot and buying a laundry sink and, and establish these throughout our sites. You know, so they can keep themselves their hands clean and so forth. And you know, we post signs all over our projects. You know, in English and Spanish to make sure they all understand and stay, you know, safe while they're working on the projects. As you can see here, we put together a site logistics plan. You know, based on what we know in this project and design criteria. Um, in red, you'll see where we put the temporary fence. You know, because the most important thing on these active facilities is you know isolating us, you know, from the occupancies. You know the, the people that are in the facility you know we don't want to disrupt that um so you can see where we got our trailer you know up on the north end of, uh, top of the page and our access point will be back there where eventually the new asphalt parking lot would get us so we're kind of in the back of the house area so uh, we don't interrupt any of the operations going on in the facility as it continues to stay open our overall project approach, you know, most important thing is coordinate all of our activities, you know, like out at Osceola County, you know, we work with Rick Collins, the chief facilities engineer out there, and we're constantly with our schedules, you know, keeping them up to date where we're going next, you know, so we're not disrupting their facility itself. Um, we understand it's a 24 seven operation, you know, we maintain safety, it's the most important thing on these type of facilities. You know, we also focus on our quality control, and quality insurance programs as well. And now I'd like to turn it over to Nathan Butler. He's gonna to talk to you about more like the site security and fencing, utilities and infrastructure and security systems. Thank you, Rick, good morning. Uh, yes, we've taken a very close look at the site. We certainly understand the need to maintain a secure perimeter uh, throughout every phase of this project. So we've taken a very close look at the existing perimeter uh, working with Wharton Smith uh, to look at what the temporary uh, secure perimeter needs would be throughout each phase of the project's construction, and then what the, the final and, and complete perimeter will look like uh, at the end of the, the day on this. In terms of the site utilities and infrastructure, uh, this is something that we've also taken a very close look at across our team. Uh, we certainly understand the need to maintain continuous operations for this facility throughout every phase of this construction. Uh, we also understand the budget constraints and, and certainly want to identify areas within the existing utilities and the infrastructure where we can realize savings without sacrificing anything in terms of the, the overall functionality for the facility and that need to maintain the safety and security and continuous operations for the facility throughout. Uh, security systems is also an area of this project that we've looked at very closely. We've had uh, some great opportunities to review this in detail with Miller Electric, who's the provider for systems um, out there. And uh, so we've developed a very thorough understanding of what's there today, and uh, I think a comprehensive understanding of what the projected needs are for the future with this expansion. I'm looking at that as a seamless environment uh, as it relates to video surveillance, to access control, and maintaining that secure perimeter uh, throughout each phase of this project. But again, at the end of the day, coming together with a product that is seamless. Uh, and as continuous operation. Um, 
I'm going to turn it over to Andy now to talk with you about the overall budget parameters for the project. Thank you, Nate. Our pricing includes all the project challenges and complexities we have described. We are confident in our numbers and have a thorough understanding of the project. The project budget was established some time ago and due to cost escalation of five to six percent per year, the costs have been exceeded. Major cost items include the new parking areas, security fencing, gates and controllers, security grade doors, security ceilings, plumbing, HVAC, and electrical. We have included the emergency shutoff to the cells like the existing facility has. This was not called for in the proposal documents, but in talking to the staff, we understand that that is required. The new electrical service, including the concrete and case primary duct bank generator and main distribution panels are major costs. The new control room, security cameras, access points, low voltage systems all tie back into the existing control room and are also substantial costs. We have included an allowance for the new secure visitation area inside the existing JDC. Since submitting our proposal, we have continued to review the design and look for ways to reduce the budget. We have had meetings with Miller Electric, your current security contractor at the JDC, and discussed options for saving money. We continue looking at the project and the schedule and ways to perform the work within the existing facility early so we can save time and impact, reduce impacts to the operations. As the design develops, we will walk the site with the major trades to develop the construct building plan and make sure the project goes as smoothly as possible. One challenging aspect of the project is installing the new roof drains and roofing above the existing occupied cells. In talking to our subcontractors, we have developed a plan to develop, to do all this work above the existing security cells while maintaining operations. This is a challenging project. With our detailed planning and coordination, it will be a success. So we put together a quick summary schedule and it's key to understand during a design phase, we've identified three deliverables, the schematic, DDs, and CDs, get us to our GMP and NTP within six to seven months. What's key during this project is permitting, you know, getting them involved ahead of time so we don't have too many comments and questions. And then we uh, got our construction schedule. We're sitting about roughly nine, 10 months, and we've identified some key milestones there, you know, that you got to get on early, like commission test balance, so we can uh, make sure the project gets open on time. So again, why? Fort Smith and HK has. Well, it's our experience, it's a cohesive team. You know, we have the experience not only working together on numerous projects, but here for Seminole County. We know what it takes and we know what you all expect from us. And as it relates to cost and scheduling, and we know every project we've got within, you know, the budget where you guys can, um, can um, accept and get the design you want with it. You know, bring our lessons learned throughout Osceola County, you know, all the, the million square foot of of uh, facilities that HKS is designed. And Ward Smith, this is our home, Cinema County. You know, we will always support our county and go the extra mile. Thank you. All right, I'll wait until we get my screen back so I can see everyone. Okay, questions from the commission. Commissioner Delari. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have a question for, I'm not too sure what the individual is that spoke about this, but he was talking about some items that weren't in the proposal, but that was in their cost estimate, i.e. the tie into the control room for uh, cell shutdown. Can we hear more about what's in their proposal, but not what was in the uh, staff proposal? No, that's the... Uh... Okay. There you go. Sorry about that. Uh, that's the uh, emergency water shutoff to the uh, cells. Uh, it's a solenoid uh, emergency shutoff, so in case there's uh, flooding within the secure area. In case there's flooding within the secure area, the uh, water can be shut off from control rooms. Is there anything else that is uh, in your cost the, uh, that wasn't? Is there anything else that's in your cost that wasn't in the proposal or the suggestion? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? 
So are there any other items that's in your cost? Because you are significantly higher in your estimate that wasn't in the uh, proposal that was put out by our staff. I staff, you're gonna have to control the, the microphone for the participants, please. Good. That's the only major item that I can identify off the top. That's it, in addition to yeah. Commissioner Lockhart. To add a part B to Commissioner Delari's question, how much of your cost can be attributed to that element? The emergency shutoff, what approximately, how much of value is there in that? Uh, it's uh, approximately twenty to forty thousand dollars. Okay. And I, I had some questions along that same line. I thought I heard there were numerous things that weren't in the proposal or that were in the proposal that were not in uh, the original scope or the staff uh, recommendations. But so I'm hearing now it's only an emergency water shutoff is, is, is I just want to make sure that's clear. In a presentation, I thought I heard numerous things that were um, written into this proposal that were not part of the original scope. Uh, just to be clear, there are also uh, renovations for the uh, uh, visitation area. It was mentioned in the proposal, but we had to clarify that it was part of the proposal. Okay. So there's a secure visitation within the existing uh, uh, JDC. Um, that's uh, one other item. Okay, and um, I'm glad to see it was covered because I have a concern that the statement that, that one of you made was the experience and understanding uh, of what things may be needed that perhaps were not considered during the course of this original scope of work. Getting into change orders and so forth, um, that, that I always have a huge concern with based on what's already happened, at least on one project I've been involved with. Um, so you're, you're comfortable these numbers are pretty pretty solid? Absolutely, yes. We've worked through the engineering, especially on the electrical and security with uh, our electrical engineer, as well as uh, some uh, subcontractors. They're familiar with the facility and really determined how a 24 seven operation could continue while we upgrade the uh, new service to uh, serve the existing facility as well as uh, uh, serve the uh, expansion. And that really, and, goes, that and, really and, goes for the new power and the, uh, and the uh, uh, security aspect of it. To speak to that in a little more detail, uh, Rob, would you like to uh, say a few words? Sir, electrical engineer. I don't right. think I heard. I think I was on a delay out there. Oh, what was the question? Um, part of the question was how can we be sure that we have it completely covered and that uh, we're confident that we can keep this facility running 24 7 as well as do the expansion and improvements? Gotcha. Um, so you actually have an interesting scenario. I'm sorry, myself, my name is Brad Pascarella. I'm the electrical engineer um, for the project. I work for Matern Engineering. Um, to that point, uh, yes, it would be, it's a, it's a challenge to keep the facility operational. However, uh, with our plan of re, basically, basically redoing the main electrical service uh, it presents an opportunity for us to backfeed the existing service with a temporary generator while the um, primary work can be uh, conducted um, or the new primary work can be, can be conducted. So it would be a very short uh, switch over time um, of the electrical systems. And what, we can, what we're looking at doing is extending over again, over a period of time, all the existing loads from the existing service to the new service and slowly bringing everything online. So at, at a certain point, you may have two services entering the building, which may introduce a little bit of effort for fire or for safety reasons, but um, we do have a plan laid out 
to keep this uh, facility um, open and operational 24 seven with very short switch over times working closely with the electrical contractor. Okay. Uh, and, and finally also question on the price schedule. Um, you have a, on the following alternatives, the moving of the portable buildings and disposal of portable buildings, looks like you have respectively $32,000 and $9,000 in addition to the 4.995, is that correct? Uh, the the 9,000 for the demolition is part of our base bid. It was just in the bid form, it was called out. So the 9,000 for the demolition is part of our base bid. The 32,000 would be an additional cost to relocate them. Okay, so if I, I'll make sure that we're clear on that. So the 32,000 is not included in the, the base bid, but that's the 9,000 is. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're uh, any, anyone else from the commission? Commissioner Lockhart. Well, I, I'd like to ask the same question um, that I posed to the other um, finalists because I, and I also noticed in some of your opening comments, you stated that you were able to have some conversation with folks um, at the JDC. And so could you share with us who from the sheriff's office and the folks that are actually operating the facility you've talked to to gain an idea and understanding of how what you're proposing actually works with how the facility operates and that those who will be essentially living there <laughs> um, would would be um, able to say that what you're proposing works aside from your professional judgment and what you have done in terms of experience with other projects you've completed um, to what extent have you actually interacted with the folks at the sheriff okay. And of course, our hope is these people are short stay visitors, not, not right. technically living there long term. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are there longer than we'd like, unfortunately. Okay. Well, the discussions we had uh, started with the initial site walk um, with the uh, staff and uh, purchasing to get an overview of the facility inside and out. Uh, we had. Uh, uh, the opportunity to visit the uh, facility again and uh, look at some of the uh, uh, back of house, the electrical mechanical rooms, those sort of things and, and get a better understanding of the logistics that's required to tie the two uh, um, control rooms together, as well as uh, look at uh, areas where we need to get access above ceilings. Um, there is some areas above the existing cells where we have to put in uh, uh, some new roof drains while the cells are occupied. It's uh, quite a challenge, but maintaining security by not penetrating the existing plaster ceilings, the security ceilings is the approach that I referenced earlier. We have to drain the existing roof into the new expansion to get the water, uh, storm water uh, off the roof and, uh, and out of the building effectively. So that's one aspect. Uh, there's overhead ceiling work for the new electrical that Brad was referring to. Uh, when the new electrical room is powered up with the new distribution panel, all that powering has to go above secure ceilings again to get into the new expansion. Right. So let me just, not to interrupt you, but just to try and be maybe a little more um, focused on my question. Were you able to interact with anyone who operates the juvenile detention facility during those tours to talk with them about how your design and what you're proposing fits with the way they operate the facility? And if so, do you know who that was that you actually interacted with? I'm not talking about our purchasing staff or electrical mechanical. Um, no, I don't have any names specifically. Uh, there was no uh, discussions. Uh, about uh, uh, the aspects of how how the, they operate day to day, other than how juveniles are brought in and brought out. But, uh, but you did talk to someone who operates the facility, maybe uh, Bernard Johns, who's the actual juvenile detention facility manager. Is he? 
I'm sorry. I see. I believe he uh, conducted the site uh, tour. You see the warden that conducted the site tour. Then yes. I, I think what Commissioner Lockhart's trying to get at, and and pardon me, Commissioner Lockhart. I don't want to step on your toes. I think what she's trying to get at. Are you confident that the people that run and operate this facility on a daily basis, you've had ample interaction with to clearly understand what the needs are from an operational basis in your proposal? That is our understanding at this time, yes. Okay. Is that Mr. fair, Mr. Lockhart? I didn't mean that. I wasn't trying to hijack. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate. I was obviously not being uh, direct enough in my questioning um, I, I just want to make sure we're building this facility for the people who are going to operate it and that they have had input and think that what is being proposed is going to work for them. I agree 100%. Okay, Commissioner Delari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the question that I have is almost along the same lines because this uh, applicant actually showed drawings of the security system, the fencing, the access, and the control rooms. The other one didn't. And I'm trying to figure out since they actually provided drawings uh, or sketches, I should say, there's significant emphasis on those elements. And I'm trying to figure out percentage wise, what that is percentage of the cost of the project. Well, I'll, I'll start out with that, that question, Commissioner Delore. Hope, hopefully it can help to round out you know, some of the answers that, that others you know, we've had questions about as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Andy to answer some more of the questions about the budget uh, as it relates to that. Um, but in terms of the, the drawings and the design effort that you've seen um, so far, that has, it has been informed uh, by the staff that operate the facility to the degree that we've had access to, to them um, through the, the site visits that have been afforded to the teams. Uh, and through the scope documents that have been provided to us up to this point, which have been been Plentiful. We've received a lot of information uh, about the existing facility and its various iterations over the, the decades uh, as it's been, you know, renovated and expanded over the years. So we've, we've certainly gained a, a very good understanding of, of it and of its site uh, parameters and had some very good opportunities to uh, have those discussions with the staff. I guess what I would say is that what you've seen so far is really a conceptual or a schematic level of design effort. Uh, what we would look forward to is engaging with the staff further as we go forward to develop this into a complete set of, of documents uh, that we would, we would you know, flesh out with that input of the staff uh, through every step of the way across the, the whole team. But I can tell you that in addition to the design documentation that you all have seen to this point, um, we've, we've, we have really taken a deep dive into it as a, a design team and as a, a design build team. Uh, we've modeled the building. We've taken a very close look at the structural systems, at the, all the MEP and technology and security systems, at all the civil and site you know, drainage and infrastructure systems. And uh, so we've developed a very comprehensive model of that and leveraged that to our understanding that not to convey some, some compelling you know, three-dimensional imagery for you, but to just you know, assure you that we've taken that deep dive and that for us, the creativity, the design kind of challenge within this is in developing that seamless system and keeping this facility up and running 24 seven. Um, and at the end of the day, delivering a product to you that is seamless and that is secure and is safe for all of the occupants, uh, the staff, uh, as well as the, the juveniles that uh, will be there there too. So I think as it relates to the, the budget, Andy, I'll turn it over to you, but I guess if, before I do that, is there, are there any, uh, Commissioner DeLaurie, did I speak sufficiently to your question from a design standpoint? Uh, is there not, not, not yet. And the reason why I'm asking is because okay. you actually showed sketches of, as I said, the control rooms, the security, the fencing, and the access. And if you showed sketches, there must be significance of, of importance to it. And I'm trying to figure out what that importance is dollar-wise. Okay. Well, I'll turn to uh, Andy to come in and talk to you about the, the dollars and cents aspect of it then, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, um, we uh, developed that security plan with uh, Bill Anseri from uh, Miller Electric, who's your current uh, security provider for cameras and access control. Uh, I did tour the facility uh, with the security in mind. It's obviously uh, the heart and soul of this project. And to answer your question on the cost, the security 
cost specific to the uh, cameras and access control is about $200,000. But in addition to that, the security fencing, uh, the security components of the other trades like mechanical, the electrical, uh, the total value of security component of the project is close to $400,000. So I hope that, uh, that uh, answers your question. That answer your question, Commissioner Delari? For the time being, it does. Thank you. Okay, your hand is still up, sir. If you could drop it. Commissioner Carey? So I heard you during your presentation mention GMP, guaranteed maximum price. So let's just talk about what this estimate really is. Um, in a design build, typically once a team is selected, they dive into the project, meet with all of the people involved, um, start to do the design process. And then as estimates are being developed as designs are being developed. And then if you start to see that it's out of balance for the budget that you've been given, um, adjustments are typically made. Would you say that's correct statement? Yes, absolutely. And so is this, this is a maybe a question for staff. So is this a design build with a guaranteed maximum price? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody on staff who wants to take that? Yes, sir. Ms. Uh, this one, what the proposal on this one was a is a lump sum with the expectation that it is the final cost and any adjustments would be down from here and there wouldn't be an opportunity to go up from this proposed pricing. Okay, so did we have a set of schematics or something that we provided for them to kind of do a takeoff on, or we just I left it up? Uh, hold on, hold on one moment, Commissioner. She, staff can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. There was a sound issue. Is that muted? Somebody needs to mute the other devices. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So was there a schematic given to the two firms that made it to phase two that said, you know, here's the basis of design or did we just leave it up to them to their own assumption as to what was gonna have to be included? The criteria package was for the requirements of the build as far as um, the performance requirements, what they had to, how many rooms, how many parking spaces, what size, and those kind of things were provided in the general, in the design criteria package. I don't recall there being a schematic. Can you confirm, John? We do, we provided them with a, with a base of design and also min, minimum performance and based on the uh, and, uh, size of the building and uh, layout, uh, floor layout. And, uh, and based on that, that's what I provide. And that proposal will be not to exceed uh, what, uh, that proposal with the scope of work we put and basic design we came up. Okay, so some of these things that they've been talking about, like you know uh, the drainage issue from off the roof, the fencing, security, operating, all of that, that's really been left up to them to put a number on. That should be included in that, in that proposal. Okay, well, I, I get that it's included in their proposal. I'm trying to determine, you know, if I'm the one doing the bidding and I wanna make sure that I haven't left something out that is gonna cost me at the end, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna be higher. So is this, so once the design is finished, is this going to then be priced to a GMP before you start construction? No, unless we ch unless we make a change. Uh, okay. Looks like we got a technology issue. Hold up one moment. Can we have staff check the feed on staff? Uh, looks like Mr. Dredge is frozen in time.
Okay, well, let's, while we're waiting for well, that. Well, so, so maybe maybe the presentation, maybe the Wharton Smith folks can, can address that. So you mentioned in your presentation, the GMP, which is guaranteed maximum price. So are you saying that your number, the 4995 is your GMP and, um, and that there, that won't change after the design is actually done and everything is, uh, you know, value engineered? It's, we have, uh, we, we expect, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We expect them, the bidders had already done their uh, value engineer. And if we don't ask them to make a change to uh, different from what the basic design, we expect that the, uh, uh, the, the price remains the same. Unless during the design, they find some area where they can save money, they want to change, we will consider at that time. But we're not expecting that bid to go above unless we make changes. Okay, and you, you have three, you have less than $4 million budgeted for this project. Uh, I think we have a, what is the- four, We have $4 million budgeted yes. for the project. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. And, and I think that goes back to the question, um, and I want to verify with, uh, with Wharton Smith, uh, the, the same question I asked Collage earlier, which was, I mean, you guys are expert, uh, and this is this dovetails on Commissioner Carey's question, which is, we didn't hand you all a set of plans and say, this is what we want you to do. You all received the scope, you received uh, what needed to be done, and you've made your estimates based on your experience in building what has been presented or asked of you in that scope. Is that a fair analysis? Yes, sir. I mean, it's, it's not, we gave you a set of plans and said, you're gonna put these drains on a roof and you're gonna put these fences and do all that, um, which, which has been my fear of things change after we get the ball rolling or in this case, in a maximum price that, uh, you know, we find ourselves in a situation where we have to then cost build or efficiently find alternatives. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. The other question I had for you all at, at Wharton was, I'm looking at your tabbed item in the booklet you provided us, uh, tab three, schedule of events. And I've looked at this in detail and I've looked at the, the other applicants um, in detail. And so my question is, these items on those pages in tab three, to me, are very specific and very specific with certain aspects of the timeline on very specific of components that are taking place on those dates. It is, is that a cut and paste or is that a legitimate and real a proposal for this project? No, sir. That that's a legitimate proposal specifically for this project. That so, is the schedule of events we came up with by reviewing the design criteria. So, by example, help me understand how how can you put reprime and first coat of paint gypsum board walls May five of twenty one through May ten of twenty one? I mean, you've got it nailed down to like a five day window. Um, which I'm impressed about. And, yeah. and so, I mean, what it tells me is you've put some thought to this. I mean, these are legit dates or? Yes, sir. I mean, even at the job site level, you'll even see a, a more what we call our uh, production planning boards where it shows activities by every day. You know, so we even take it from here and get more level detail with our subcontractors in the field and get their commitments we'll put milestones as stars up there so we know what's got to happen every day to comply with that schedule so let, let me ask that in a little different fashion if you were the applicant that was chosen and during the course of this project could, could i walk on the site with this schedule of events or any of these other commissioners or staff and on those dates and say, hey, 
are we doing the the priming and the gypsum board today or this week? I mean, is it? And I'm just trying to get to how specific it really is. It just seems that there's a lot of that in comparison to the other applicant. I'm just, I want to make sure it's real and legit information. But it, it, it's real to what we know today. If you don't set a plan like this and you really detail it out, you got to get a plan. You know, and we all know that things might happen throughout sure. the construction. But if you don't set a plan up front, and it's you're never going to make that plan. We're going to hit some some obstacles, and that's why at the job site we do those production planning boards, and we document, you know, what might have happened, whether you know, uh, you know a, a submittal didn't get approved on time, or whatever it might be a rain delay or whatever. We document that. But if you don't have a plan at this level from the get go. And for Andy to even look at, and then when he's putting his pricing together, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Carey was waiting. Commissioner Carey, then Commissioner Delari. Well, so in your proposal, I see you use Primavera for your scheduling, which is a very detailed to, to Commissioner Zimbauer's uh, question. I mean, when you start construction, you you want to have a schedule that is this detailed as to exactly when everything is going to happen, and anybody can walk on the job and and see that it's on site, you know, that it's on on track. Um, I think then the collage proposal that it was more of a just a generic timeline, you know, between this date and that date, and as you can see from the dates from the time they submitted this, they submitted it as they were starting in March. And so all of these dates are going to slide, but at the end of the day, when they start, you will, you should have a construction uh, schedule like that. Um, my question to uh, Wharton Smith is, do you do daily logs and reports back to, to your clients when you're under construction? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. And then we, my question we, we, for staff, we... I'm sorry. Did you have something besides yes, ma'am? No, I'll just say agree with what you're saying, but we we weekly with the with the staff yeah. you know, every week we'll have a meeting. And what we also done in the past is you know is uh, sometimes we'll come to the one of the commission meetings and do a monthly executive report you know, yeah. to the commission as well. well. I'm just I'm used to getting daily logs when somebody's under construction, so I wanted to just make sure that oh, well, somebody else was going to be getting that. Um, <laughs> And then the question, this question is for staff, is there liquidated damages in this uh, in this contract? Yes, that would be, yes, that is a liquidation damage. So anything over, I think I heard earlier, 571 days or however many days it is that you're proposing for this, it, there would be liquidated damages if they're not finished. Right, yeah. And, and Commissioner uh, and Francis Sheriff, uh, Bill Johnson was involved from day one on every aspect of that of that of that uh, plan. Yes, you are. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Delari. Thank you. We're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do appreciate the question that you and Commissioner Kerry talked about with the uh, scheduling of the contractor or the, the builder. But my question is going to be more towards the architect because the architect needs to be just as in lockstep with the uh, contractor, uh, what software do they use uh, to actually monitor this on uh, a daily basis? And then I have a follow-up question, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. Uh, Hi, uh, Commissioner Glory. To speak to your question in terms of, uh, of monitoring design progress uh, each, each day, um, we, uh, uh, rather than a, a software platform, we have our internal processes that we use in terms of our, our daily workflow across the design team, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, managing that on a weekly and then monthly basis. And in this case, you know, in a design build delivery, that's something that happens across the whole team. So in terms of the, the software piece of it, I think what we would do is dovetail into the, the overall software right. platforms that Wharton Smith would be using, and we're part of that team. Um, uh, in terms of the workflow across the design team, uh, as it relates to that, uh, we use a number of, uh, of work, workflow software uh, tools that help us to uh, collaborate and to communicate, communicate across the team 
some of those include uh, our Bluebeam Studio reviews, which we use that quite a bit, especially now in our remote working conditions. It helps us collaborate across longer distances, um, but to share information so we can all see each other's progress and mark it up, review it, uh, rework it together. Um, and then uh, we also utilize uh, our building information modeling uh, software platform, uh, which the platform that, that we use and which our, our entire team uses is uh, Revit. Uh, and that's, uh, we use that in a cloud-based uh, format so that we can all share our models uh, and that uh, the models are constantly being updated in real time uh, so that at any point the, the team is accessing uh, the, the progress as it is happening and that everyone's up to date uh, throughout each day and each you know, week and month of the, the progress. So, Thank I, you. I, yes, that answers your question, sir? That answers my question. Thank you. All right. Can I ask a follow-up to that, Mr. Yep. Chairman? Yes, please. So, um, Nathan, it looks like you've got about six, six and a half months for design in the schedule. Yes. Okay. I'm okay. just, you know, I'm just, because it's date specific, I just wanted to make sure I was clear on what was going on. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's what we've plugged in so far. And that's based on the progress we've made to this point in terms of the, the schematic level, you know, detail right. that we've applied to this, to this point. Okay, anyone else? Commissioner Constantine, do you have any inquiries? Mr. Chair, I've been listening uh, to the questions. I don't think I could add anything more. Okay. If everybody's asked the questions, I would. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Kerry? Okay, I have a question. I have, I want to talk to staff a little bit, so I don't have any more questions for the presenters, but I do have some questions for staff. Is there is there any other follow-up questions for the first applicant? Anybody have anything there? I, I do have one if if uh, they're handy. Do you have a question for Collage? Yes. Give me one second. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you. So under your schedule of events um, portion of your presentation or submittal, um, how accurate do you perceive those to be? They're very accurate. We use Primavera Project Planner P6 to develop our schedules. Obviously, in the current stage of design development and where we are in this process with you know where the actual start date would start those may move around a little bit but we had to anticipate something but we are very confident in that timeline both on the design side and on the construction side on the design side we worked with our design partners scott and cormie and the rest of the sub consultants to develop those dates for deliverables what we would expect as far as design and permitting and, and working with seminole county from a permit standpoint and then on the uh as far as the construction aspects, we actually met with some of the trade contractors to develop those timelines. I had mentioned during our presentation about the fact that we had a structure where we could build the structure independent of the existing facility. And those timelines from the footings all the way up through the structure are included. Um, and they will be further detailed as we move into uh, the design process. As we are awarded the project, every one of those activities gets further detailed. Good. Um, and on that schedule, I'm assuming by default there are built in uh, timelines for undetermined events or unknown events that typically happen in any kind of project like this. Yes. Is that you know, a fair analogy? It's fair, not only from the standpoint of weather. I mean, we all know how to anticipate the weather impacts that are happening in Central Florida. Right. But additionally, we understand that we're working around an occupied facility that we need to adapt to. We understand that we, as the design builder working right alongside the existing facility, need to make sure that we make adjustments to adapt to their needs, not necessarily the needs of construction. And on how many other occasions have you been in this scenario 
uh, of a, a uh, I don't want to call it a prison system, but it's a detention system um, that's occupied where you're having to do your construction, do your work in, in these scenarios. We do a tremendous amount of work around occupied facilities. We are, uh, we, you know, we, as we have mentioned before, we did the uh, juvenile detention or the, the juvenile justice that wasn't next to an occupied facility, but a lot of the work that we do, we're one of the continuing contractors at the airport, at, the, uh, at Goa. So we're constantly working around secure and mission critical environments. So we're very familiar with the need to make sure that we understand what we're doing and how we're not impacting the ongoing operations of who's occupying that facility or our neighbors, which in this case, because of the way the site is outlined and what we included in our package shows a logistics plan that shows that separation and need to make sure that we are independent of the uh, ongoing operations of the detention center. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of, of this applicant? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, staff, we have staff back in now. I think Commissioner Kerry had some questions for staff. Yeah, so, I mean, we got two highly qualified firms here, obviously, um, in the scheduling part, they both are using, you know, latest technology, Primavera and all of that. And uh, Collage's design time is a little longer than uh, than the HKS, but really I wanted to, I, I went through and I read all the comments that staff made and um, in looking at the overall project including, so either either firm I think is qualified to do the job, highly qualified to do the job. So, so it gets past that for me and I get to experience, um, schedule and dollars. And I'm sure that that's probably what staff was looking at as well. But I noticed that everybody on the selection committee, um, even though they're coming to us and ranked for us to select, I just would like to hear a little bit about maybe some of the conversations that y'all had because everybody ranked Wharton Smith number one, even though their budget number was higher. And in my opinion, everything else in their proposal was um, experience scheduling, those type of things was better. But what makes me give pause is to the pricing. So can you just speak to kind of what went on in the staff conversation about that as, as all the professionals that were reviewing this? Okay, when we, when we select, when we rank uh, consulting, that was not included in our prices. This is before, we, before the bid. And based on, on that submitter, on that qualification and on that staff, and that's what I came uh, Warren Smith number one and collage number two. So we provided the package uh, for bed for both of them since we only got two proposals, uh, two uh, consultants, but both of them qualified and we gave them a, a base of design. Both of them, they submit and they submit, they cover all the requirements we ask them, we submit to them. The, the, the ranking has nothing to do with the price, that is the proposal that came after the ranking. Okay, and so did they make, present, did they make presentations to y'all or did you simply just have the packages that we had? So you, you based it strictly off the qualification packages? Yes. Okay, but wasn't the price included in the qualification package? It isn't. No, we, okay. select, we select them, we selected two. Uh, you only two got two. So. We got two, so we select two. If we had, if we had got five, probably we would select two uh, or three and do presentation. And, and uh, but we, since we got two and both of them qualify, we ask them to uh, prepare concept plan and give us proposal. Okay, all right. I just was trying to figure out how y'all got to where right. where y'all were at and the documentation that I had in the package here. And I have a question for staff. Um, I know you all have heard me say this at least on a couple of occasions. I, I'm somewhat concerned that we've only had two bidders on a project of this size and scope. Um, is it because 
the market is so busy? Is it because it's just a limited amount of people that can do this kind of project? Um, I would have suspected we would have had more, um, you know, give, give a proposal. Can you help me with that? Well, we it is a, it is a lot of work, especially at that time when we submitted. And it is not unusual that time of days for building construction in a project, a small project, $4 million, to see a very limited uh, number of contacts that will be done. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Kerry, you had, you had your well, hand. Yeah, I could want to speak to that. The last time we went out, we only had two. And again, it's $4 million is a small project in the scheme of things for a lot of these contractors. Right. And the market has been really good. It was really good the last time we went out. And certainly in November, we're putting this together. These proposals were due in November of last year, pre-COVID. Everybody was very busy. And and when you only got limited marketing dollars, you're going to pick your targets based on where your expertise is at. So, um, so I, uh, I, I that doesn't surprise me. We only got two. I think if we were hard bidding it, we probably would have got more projects. But in the world of design, build, and construction management, this is a very small project for for most of these guys. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Delari. I would agree with Commissioner Kerry. Uh, back pre-COVID-19, uh, the market was extremely difficult. And what I mean by difficult was that it was hard to get people to bid on many different projects on multiple sizes. Uh, for construction projects of complexity, the, this has some complexity to it because of the security standpoint. You'd get even less because of the market. That's what was happening prior to COVID-19. Things have changed since then. Sure. Okay. Any other inquiries or questions, Commissioner Lockhart? Well, I'd like to um, explore the comments that Commissioner Delari and Commissioner Kerry just made. It, would it be, um, and staff, I, I'd, you know, whoever wants to take this on, is there any, um, with COVID and all of the things that are going on, is there any rationale to assuming that either of these prices may come back or, or could come back differently given the market? I mean, are, are we making a decision today with price in the, I mean, price is the big elephant in the room for me in, in these two proposals. And so is there any reason to believe that pricing given today's circumstances would be different? And, and how would that impact our decision-making today? Well, well maybe as, the I under, as I understood it from my earlier question, the price that they have given is the maximum price that they could charge based on the project. So the only way the price is going to change is going to be if we add something to it or take something away. That's why I was asking about earlier about the gear, you know, is this going to come back as a guaranteed maximum price or is this, these numbers that we have are their maximum that they can charge based on the, based on the, construction document that they got, although they didn't get a schematic, they just got something that said it's going to be, you know, 8,500 square feet, and it's going to be this, that, and the other, and it's going to tie in, and you know the complexity because of your experience. So um, that's why I had asked those earlier questions about what did the, did the proposers get that right. they were basing this on? Were they just, you know, if you go out and you walk a job and your experience and you say, okay, this is going to be a problem. So let's make sure we put plenty of money in the budget to cover that item. Um, and maybe you miss it. And so usually a, on a pro, I, this is my experience and Commissioner Delari could probably speak to this as well. But my experience is on a project this size to have that big of a gap in the budget, either I think one's probably done a lot to make sure they included everything they needed to and one tried to get skinny to make sure their number was low. And, and if they miss something, it's gonna be on them as I heard what staff answered my earlier question. So right. if this goes to collage, it's gonna be $3,579,473 or less. Right. Unless we add something to it. Right. And so, you know, but I, again, I think that pricing comes from experience. And when you've done projects like this, 
and you say security is going to be a big issue, let's make sure we've got that covered. Because if you don't have it covered, it's coming out of your bottom line in, in the scheme of things. Right. So to help me, staff, maybe you can share with me um, in this process, would deductive change orders come into play at some point we would expect to see? Well, a ch change order should should be if it's unforeseen, for example, uh, not yes. in the building itself, or we made a change. We, when we were preparing that bid, we got the IT involved, communication involved, the sheriff involved to make sure we cover everything they want. Also, we provide a concept uh, floor plan. We're not, I'm not expecting any major change order unless we decided we want to add something to uh, to that project. Well, and, and, and on that note, I think the problem with that is, <laughs> at least for me, I've been to this movie already since I've been on this commission. We, we've, we've taken a low bidder and lo and behold, by the time we're done, the low bidder is almost back at the same price that the other bidders were at. So. Uh, shame on us. But uh, I think what I'm hearing with Commissioner Lockhart's question and Commissioner Terry's explanation, make sure I've got this right. It really is the duty of the applicants to have taken the scope that we've given them with their knowledge, their expertise, and their experience to come up with what they believe is going to be the right product for the right work and the right price. Now, with that kind of spread, to me, that could mean somebody left something out. And if that's the case, you know, does that mean we may find some shortcuts being taken? I don't know. Does it mean we may not get everything we need? Or does it mean we could be forced into a change order? Um, that That's why I questioned collage originally saying, you know, this is your field of expertise. Is there anything that you may have seen that, that was needed or overlooked or et cetera, et cetera? I think the answer I received was no, there wasn't. So I, I just want to make sure that my, I appreciate all the input. I really do. Cause it helps me to formulate where my thought process is. But if we're thinking that perhaps the market has changed even since perhaps March when these numbers, the beginning of March when these numbers were brought to us, would the guaranteed maximum price of one or both of them perhaps be less given today's circumstances if, if we fast forwarded a few months to today? And again, I understand what I'm asking you to use a crystal ball but because of the spread, and I understand the rationale for why some may be more and some may be less, um, is there any mechanism in the purchasing code and, and legally that we could ask folks to, set, to recognize, hey, we know the market is different. Would, have your numbers changed or would they change in a deductive way? And how would that, would they and how would that work? I mean, you're, you're referring to a market pressure or market change, I think. Right. And well, and, you know, COVID, whatever. I mean, right. it, it, lots can happen in the world between in a, in a quarter of time right. and asking our staff legally and from our purchasing process, is there a mechanism for proposers to say, hey, the world has changed since we first came up with this number and now this is our new number? I'm not saying that either of these companies would do that. I'm just asking is, does the mechanism exist? Right. General. So generally with this design build process, when the only changes that would happen to the pricing is when you get further into the development of that design and you get closer to the point of you're ready for that final cost. And generally this, this proposed cost acts as a cap. So the only changes that they can make to their proposed amount is to reduce it based on efficiencies or value engineering or the decision to 
do or design or construct something in a more efficient or effective manner. They can't come back and say, well, market conditions have changed. So now we have to increase or you know flex our price to meet those new market conditions. They don't have that availability in this. No, I'm not asking about going up. I understand what guaranteed maximum is. I get that it's maximum. I'm asking, can can it come back down? And what would that mechanism be? And and so I'm, you know, I know at, at the college, for instance, we have had a lot of construction projects there, and it is not uncommon to have deductive change orders come back to us as a board. And we all, you know, every one of us wants to jump to be the one to motion to accept the deductive change order. Right. Um, so I'm just asking, what can you help me understand in this particular procurement process, how one or both of these entities at this point could come back and refine their number down if they believe that is appropriate? Generally, no, not at a stage two of a, of a design build solicitation process. They wouldn't, we wouldn't ask them to go back and do further information sourcing or further design because you're asking them to put more work onto the process that wasn't really initially intended or initially disclosed for them to participate in the stage two before a selection is made. Generally, those things are done with your selected firm to identify any potential savings or changes to the design to get those kinds of deducted deductions okay. to the cost. Okay. Mr. Applegate, you had something you wanted to say? Uh, Jamie took the words out of my mouth. And also I just, again, to me both in both presentations, they did address COVID-19 and the latest uh, issues that they're gonna be dealing with, so. Okay, thank you. And of course, I think that it will go to Commissioner Delari. But I mean, the reality is with a maximum cost, I mean, that, that cuts both ways. If their costs go way up, they, they still can't exceed the cost. If their costs go way down for some reason, they benefit. Um, you know, my, my hopes would be with, with either of these, if there are areas that can be reduced, if that's a, a situation, that, you know, we would have an honest dealing that, that those costs could be reduced if something was taken out or not needed or et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Commissioner Delari. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Uh, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, since Wharton Smith's talking about the control room, security, fencing, and that was really pretty much one of their highlights of their presentation. I wanna make sure that those elements that they're talking about from a security standpoint are being addressed on both sides, both consultants. And the only way to actually do that, because you know I'm not a security expert, I didn't see what they saw. Uh, I didn't know if the sheriff's department actually had some input on how we're actually uh, going to be building this thing. Looking at it from, uh, does it make sense from a standpoint of operational? Because if it doesn't, then that will be a change uh, order to increase the cost. And I want to make sure that we're looking at that. Uh, I'll, let I'll let staff answer that. I think I heard both applicants say that they've worked with all the parties and they both have security measures, understanding it's a build project while well occupied. But staff, if you... Did the sheriff want to look at that yet? Because they're the ones that are operating, operating it. So, Jamie, do you have some input on that? You're, okay. you're muted. Yeah, as I stated before, Bill Johnson, uh, a friendly sheriff, was involved and included okay. from from day one of that project, and and uh, and, the, and both of the uh, applicants they had access to uh, the same access to the yes. staff. Then the other question I have, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that when we did the jail expansion, it was it was a significant project, and I think it was upwards of somewhere around $40 million if my mind, if my memory strikes me correctly. And it was, Skanska was the contractor with HKS and Wharton Smith. And they actually, after the GMP was set, they saved us a significant amount of money as well. Of tune of several million dollars. Okay, Commissioner Carey. So a question for staff, is there anything in the contract regarding cost, cost savings by the contractor where they would share and participate uh, in those cost savings? No. Okay, so 
So, and and, I'll, and to be honest, I mean, we don't have the RFP, so we don't really know what was in the RFP that was not part of our package. So that's why I had so many questions about it, because if I could have read the RFP, I would have had a little better idea of what it was that you were asking them to do. But um, if there's no cost savings shared with the contractor or whatever, I mean, the way I look at this is you got two proposers, they all had the same opportunity, both qualified to do the work. Um, construction really didn't slow down in my experience during the COVID-19. Um, maybe, you know, if somebody was planning a hotel project or something like that, where there's probably gonna be a flux of that maybe in the market, maybe those projects got put off, but for the most part, you know, single story, you know, multi-story, multi-family, all of that stuff just continued to go on. And, um, but, you know, we got a 28% differential between one and the other firm. And that, and, and if it's, and like I said, as I understand it, and I, I just want one more confirmation on this, unless you go out there and say, I want to add another, you know, 100 feet, or you go back and say, I want this to be tilt wall versus, you know, split face block, and you're giving demands, this is what it is. Now, the only other comment I'll make on that is, we don't know what these contractors are going to design, because there is a maintenance element to that as well. So from, for staff, was there any specifics in the RFP that said this is going to be split face block, tilt wall, traditional construction, did we specify that or we're gonna leave that totally up to the design team? Uh, oh, hang on, John. Um, for the first part of your comments, Commissioner Carey, there, there isn't currently a provision in there that would provide for a mechanism to share or experience whatever cost savings. However, with it, once the approval happens, we can all, we're going to enter negotiations. So if that's something that we want to see in that agreement, we can always um, adjust the agreement itself to add that kind of provision. Okay, before if you leave that, let me just ask you this. You're going to enter negotiations. You're going to enter negotiations for what? You've, you've it would, given it, them a, a set of documents to say, this is what I want you to build, and they've given you a price. So, so tell me what you're going to enter negotiations on. It would really just be negotiations over the agreement. If there's terms that we want to add or, or amend or change from the agreement itself, we wouldn't really be entering negotiations for the sake of the project because at this point we've provided the performance requirements of the project and they provided what they expect to be able to design and deliver. Okay, so, but you, didn't you also provide a uh, sample contract as part of the RFP? Yes. Okay, so I'm. I, I think I think where Commissioner Carey's coming from is, it, once this contract is awarded, what what motive does the the <laughs> the winning applicant have in negotiating and reducing their costs? They, there's no incentive really it's just if there was the, if there was a provision like that that you wanted added to the agreement that's something that we could explore that in that manner uh, sure, sure and, and i just think that should be in our normal course of business i think anytime that we can have cost savings and share it with the contractor that gives them an incentive to save us money and you know because they're going to benefit from it as well right but if there if so if there was no specification here so again this is maybe where the price differential comes in. Okay. Based on experience, if I'm an experienced contractor who's built these type of facilities and I know that maintenance long term is going to be an issue, my construction material may be very different than the low bid mm -hmm. if, if that wasn't specified. So was there any specification in the space? Yes. yes, I give you an example. For the exterior, okay? For the... Uh, Exterior wall construction. We we specify uh, we specify uh, CMU, okay. okay. That all both of them bidding on that for the uh, uh, for the uh, interior. We specify hollow. Uh, we specify CMU or HSS. Okay, okay one so of them. You did give them. So, yeah. so you, okay, before you said you didn't. So now you're saying you did give them specifics about the expectation of what you expect the materials to be. Right. So the, okay, yes. so they're both basically responding to the same material list. So, so that, okay, so that theory's out, but 
Again, right. without us seeing what you gave them, it's kind of hard for us to guess. But uh, yeah, we we gave them a certain specification. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none. Do we have anyone, Clint, from the public? Uh, that is on the phones desiring to make uh, any input on this item? Uh, no, sir. No hands are raised. Okay. Seeing none, then we will go to uh, board action on behalf of uh, staff. And if you'll outline what you would like us to do with these documents and grading. So your, what you have before you is a ranking sheet for the two firms. What you'll do is based on the, the technical and pricing proposals and their presentation of it, you'll rank each firm first or second. And then um, I can give you a few minutes if you want to record that if you didn't already do it. And then each commissioner will read your individual rankings for tabulation. And then um, I can share my screen to show the final tabulation. And then that's for uh, your discussion and a motion and approval, if that's what you wish. Okay. So, uh, just Any a questions? technical question, you know, because I'm technically challenged on, uh, so is the, how are we getting the ranking sheet to you? Do you want us to text you? Do you want us to, I mean, I'm, we're not, most of us are not in the office, so I didn't like we can just hand it to somebody to run down the hall. Right. But, For the purposes of the meeting, you'll read your scores to me and then you'll provide the, the actual forms to me for our file afterwards. Okay. Okay, that, that makes a little more sense. And then, Mr. Chairman, the only other comment I would have on this, regardless of who we get picked, and as I said, both qualified firms, both capable of doing the job, but I do think that we should look at adding something about cost savings and contractor participation, because anytime that you can do that, I've not ever done a job where I didn't have some cost savings if the, if the contractor is participating in the savings percentage. Correct. I would agree. Concur, hundred percent. Any any other input on that item? Okay, I would agree. Okay. The only comment I would have had, Mr. Chairman, is I thought we already had that. I'm I'm surprised that uh, we're learning just now that we didn't have that in the contracts. Under understood. Uh, I, I, not not to defend Commissioner Lockhart or myself, but we just recently arrived. <laughs> yeah. oh, you're not going to get away with that because you were here in last year when we put this out. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, our job is not to, to right. write request for proposals and to write scopes of work. But our assumption is that our practice for the last 15 and a half years of including all that stuff has is why I assumed that it was in there. And I certainly hope that maybe now that we have some new folks in that department, maybe we can talk about some best practices so that, you know, so that we don't put out anything on the street without having those things in it. You know, liquidated damages, daily log reports, all of those things should be in the scope, but also we should get the RFP in our package of information so that we can actually see at least what you asked them to provide, because that would have saved us a lot of time today. <clears throat> That'll uh, definitely I'm, be corrected going forward. Right. I, 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 I suspect that that would give Commissioner Carey's ire. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'll throw this out there too, and, and this may not be something that everybody is interested in, but um, it was helpful at the school district for some projects to come before for the RFP itself to come before the board for approval so that we as a board actually had input on what was going out. Um, so we were all on the same page and it didn't come back to the board in this environment and you go, well, that wasn't what we had in mind. And so it's, it maybe took more time on the front end, but it saved some time on the back end for the board to be involved in the RFP uh, approval. Agreed. Okay. So we're going to get everybody's ranking and then we will move for a motion. 
the, do all the commissioners have their rankings already recorded or do you need to give a, do I need to give you a couple minutes? It's on a yellow pad. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. If oh, you can hi. transcribe it to the yeah, ranking sheet after these? that, that's. I, I can. I, my printer here at the house isn't networked to the, oh. um, the laptop. Okay. Okay. So are we given, are we given our rankings verbally? Is that what we're doing? Yes, ma'am. And I'll record them and I can actually share my screen to show the, the um, ranking sheet itself. Um, so and do like the same kind of roll call commissioner that Zimbauer that you've been doing and ask for their ranking right. and he's going to tabulate it. Okay. That, that's what I intend to do. Is everybody good for tabulation? Okay. Commissioner Glory. I rank Wharton Smith as number one, Colleague Design as number two. Okay, Commissioner Lockhart, I lost my screen. That's all right. I ranked Wharton Smith one and Collage number two. Commissioner Carey. When I got pushed over to the side because of the screen, I had to find the mute button. That's right. Um, I rank collage number one and Wharton Smith number two. Okay. Commissioner Constantine. Ranked Wharton Smith one, collage two. And Commissioner Zimbauer ranked Wharton Smith one, collage two. So, but the rankings as they are, the total ranking points, so to speak, Wharton Smith has six, the collage companies has nine, which means Wharton's ranked number one. Mr. Chairman, I would move to award to Wharton Smith based on the ranking. Second. Motion is second, further discussion. Seeing none, we'll call the roll. Commissioner Delari. Commissioner Delari. None mute. Aye. Mr. Lockhart? Aye. Mr. Carey? Aye. Mr. Constantine? Yes. Mr. Zimbauer, yes. Okay. Let's move on. Next up is County Manager's Report. Can you hear me? Ms. Gay, yes, we can. Okay, I have a few things that we uh, added onto the agenda for your consideration today. Um, the first item is um, I am seeking your authority to execute two leases related to property that we purchased um, through the home program. We have two homes that are currently vacant. Um, they're intended to be part of our home ownership program, but currently we don't have anybody in them. We have a couple of families that we're doing um, rehab rebuild projects for. Typically we would house them in a hotel or an apartment during um, the, the rehabilitation uh, process. We'd like to go ahead and, and let them use these two homes that are currently vacant. Um, that'll save us some money that we can put back into the rehab program. So um, we've, we've got leases that will need to be approved by the board um, so that we can move both of those families into those two vacant homes. Okay, any questions for Ms. Guillet? All right, looking for board action. Chairman, I would move approval to authorize her to sign this. Agreement. Second. The motion is second. We'll call any further discussion. Is there anybody from the public, Clint, that wants to speak on this matter? There are no, no hands raised. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carey? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Zimbauer, yes. Okay, anything else, Ms. Guillet? Yes, sir, a couple more things. Um, at, at the budget work sessions, we've discussed the Five Points Project. Um, and the last budget work session, we talked specifically about um, putting together a financing plan. Um, you didn't take any official action at that meeting and I'm, I'm seeking um, the go ahead from the board to um, have our financial advisors go ahead and start putting together the plan, taking the actions we need to in order to actually have a, a specific financing scheme put in place. 
Okay, I thought it was pretty clear during that session, but maybe not. Any comments or inquiries from the other board members? We need to memorialize it further. We can do that. Sure. Just give me the thumbs up and we're good to go. I, I think everybody's right, good to perfect. go. Great. Um, and, and along with that, um, as you know, we, as part of the master planning process, we were preparing the basis of design um, for the annex and the parking garage. Um, I, I'd like to go ahead and get your, um, your approval to move forward with submitting the, the basis of design to the three firms that have pre-qualified for design build so we can start getting that process rolling. Um, they'll have 90 days to bring back a proposal to you once we um, issue the, the basis of design. Well, I, I would suspect that should happen anyway. I mean, if you're going to go after the financing, I think we've been pretty clear. Let's not fool around with the financing if we're not moving forward with. <laughs> I, with I just the don't want to cut folks loose, Mr. Chairman. So moved. Okay. Second. Oh, we've been pretty clear on moving ahead pretty rapidly. We'll just make sure so the record's straight. Delari. Aye. Lockhart. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Constantine? Aye. Zimbauer, yes. Okay. What's next? Okay. Next is um, I distributed to you at the end of last week a proposed slate um, for the Rescue Outreach Mission Board, um, as we discussed. Um, and, and I've shared with you um, at their last meeting, the, the sitting board of the Rescue Outreach Mission Board took action uh, and unanimously voted to request um, that the, um, the Board of County Commissioners reseat a new board um, and they've all of the existing board members have tendered their resignations. Um, so we have uh, sent you out um, a proposed slate for 10 of the 15 seats. Uh, I worked with Commissioner Lockhart on this as she's your designee on, on that board. Um, there are five remaining seats, one of which must be filled by a member of um, the Rescue Mission Church of God. Uh, and then there'll be um, four other slots that can be filled by anyone. Um, we're suggesting that and recommending that the board allow the 10 people that you seat today um, to select those other five people. Uh, I'm, fine. I'm, fine with, on that. I'm fine with that. I would defer to Commissioner Lockhart as being our designee on that board. Um, I'd, be look, I'd be looking for your input and advice and what your thought is. I mean, yeah, I'm happy yeah. to support whatever your thoughts are. So I, I believe that it is extremely appropriate that there are, um, there's an opportunity for members of the Rescue Mission Church to be seated on this board in order to help select the remaining board members. Um, I'll be perfectly candid with you, um, as in a lot of these types of situations, there are rumors in the community um, about what may or may not be happening. And so I want to be really, really clear. Um, the county is not taking over the rescue outreach mission. Um, we are helping to establish a new board for the nonprofit. And once that occurs, um, that nonprofit will hopefully look for another very capable, proven um, entity who can take over the operations of the mission. Um, and, and that may sound like splitting hairs to some people, but I think it's incredibly important that um, the message to the community be that we, we value them, we value the work that is done in that community serving the homeless for Seminole County. And um, this is in no way, shape or form, um, the county commission believing that um, we can come in and do a better job. We are just here to, to help get things structured and proper running smoothly and appropriately. Um, we want to get that on the record. Uh, and I appreciate that and I agree 100%. Commissioner Carey? Well, I was going to say some of that was breaking up. I got the gist of it, but if everybody can mute their mics while we're not doing this, uh, while they're not talking, because then it's hard to hear her. But um, but I, I, I think that the points she made are correct. I think that's the right thing to do. And Mr. Chairman, do you want her to make a motion for that or? Um, you know, I, I, Commissioner oh. Constantine, you've got your hand raised. Yes, um, I, there were just um, 
since the 10 names, and I have no problem with the 10 names, I, I did uh, have three other names that um, uh, Commissioner Lockhart, I'd like at least the board to look at. Um, so I will, I will submit them to you directly um, and uh, you know, uh, from my office. And uh, I'm happy to distribute it to the whole commission. A couple of them had been on the board previously, had left, but now with the reconstituted board, they think that they uh, might be able to help. So I will give you those three names. Uh, and it, since you're going to have, since the, the, what I'm hearing is the concept is that the board will make the remaining five appointments. So I will give you those three names to be presented to the board. Okay. And if, you, and if you would, thank you, Commissioner, if you would just be sure and share that with uh, Ms. Guillet at the same time so we all know what's going on. My office did share uh, one or two names uh, with Ms. Guillet's office this week. So hopefully yeah, she gets that. I think we all have. Correct. Correct. Uh, is there anyone from the public, Clint, that, that wants to talk about this matter? No, sir. Okay. I will look for a motion. Move to okay. Second. Okay, motion and second. Any further discussion? Okay, Delari? Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Constantine? Yes. Zimbauer, yes. Okay, Ms. Gay, next. You have to turn your mic on. At your last meeting, uh, you approved a purchase order for the Time Clock Plus software. Um, the contract associated with that was not included, and it does require board approval. Nothing on the pricing or the scope of the project has changed. I just I, I need board approval to move forward with the contract. Move approval. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Clint, anybody from the public on this item? Yes, sir. Okay, Commissioner Delari. Aye. Lockhart? Aye. Gary? Aye. Constantine? Aye. Zimbauer, yes. Okay, next. Uh, just one more item, and this is just an informational item for you. Um, uh, as was brought up a couple of meetings ago, um, staff was asked to um, look into this concept of rights of nature. Um, I just wanted to give you an update of kind of where we are. Um, we have taken a hard look at what we already have in place with respect to environmental protections, both in our organization and through our regulations and policies, as well as um, as well as what's um, out there regionally and statewide. Um, and there is a very robust um, environmental protection system in place right now, um, which we think we'll continue to look at it, but, but we believe that to be sufficient um, and, and those change, you amend your comp plan, regulations change, but there is already a, a very robust system for environmental protection in place um, that, that balances needs and, and rights um, for, um, for the community. Um, so we think that that's likely going to be sufficient. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that there is um, a bill that was approved um, in, in the last legislative session, Senate Bill 712, um, it it um, has a number of environmental um, provisions within it. One of the provisions within that bill, which um, we are hearing will likely be signed by the governor, um, is a provision that would preclude any local government from establishing um, any sorts of policies related to right that whole rights of nature movement and that would um, convey any rights to any element of nature. So um, while we've done a review and put together some information on, on what's out there already, we're also watching this bill and, and really before we move any further um, and investing more staff resources in it, I, th I think it's probably best for us to sort of track that and see where that goes. And so I would ask you to just um, allow staff to stand down until we have um, a, a, better, a better idea on that, uh, on where that's going, going with, with respect to the governor. I, I would agree, Commissioner Kerry. Yeah, I would 100% agree. Um, I couldn't believe that we were even considering making more restrictive policies for our community. There's already so many layers, not only locally, but at the state level, federal guidelines. So um, I think it's a waste of staff time to continue to look at it, especially in light of this bill being signed. Okay, Commissioner Delari. Oh, Commissioner Delari, then Commissioner Constantine. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of staff's hard work. Uh, what they've sent to me, I believe that they've done an adequate uh, and a wonderful job uh, showing that there's adequate protection. Uh, I think it's always important to try to look at all things to see what's pertinent. And I believe at this time we shouldn't be moving forward. Uh, sustainability is very important and uh, that's our key objective. So thank you. I want to thank staff for their hard work. Okay. Commissioner Constantine. Yes, and I, I would agree that moving forward, uh, recognizing as, as it is always our responsibility and incumbent upon us to for us to do the right thing. And that's exactly what the staff just said. We have plenty of things in place and it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that we um, follow them. Okay. Commissioner Lockhart, did you have anything? Um, I would just concur and say that, you know, I appreciate staff and whatever it was that they were able to do um, at the direction of the majority of the board. Someone just came home. Um, but I truly hope um, that this has gone to bed and we won't see it back again after doing um, a little more research after our last meeting and the Googling that I promised I would do. I, I have absolutely uh, no interest whatsoever in pursuing this concept. So um, thank you. Thank you. So uh, is staff clear on the desire of this board and what the direction of staff is? Yes, sir. We will stand down unless we hear otherwise from the board in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gay, anything else? No, sir. Okay. Um, County attorney. I'm sorry. Report. I'm sorry. Oh. Actually, I apologize, um, Chairman. I do have one more thing we need to talk about, uh, two more okay. things we need to talk about scheduling wise. Okay. Um, we currently have a work session scheduled with the school board on July 14th. Right. Um, they have asked that um, that we move that to the fall. They've had a lot of other things I think they're trying to coordinate right now. Sure. So um, so we're going to go ahead and, and pull that from from the schedule for the time being, and we'll, we'll coordinate with them to reschedule something um, when, it, when it's more convenient for them, if that's all right with the board. Excellent. Um, Perfect. Second. Oops. Commissioner DeLauri. Just, just a quick comment. I was hoping that we'd be meeting with the school board, especially with all the... Uh, Things that have been going on with COVID-19. I just want to make sure that the county manager and the superintendent, uh, and I know they do talk quite a bit on many different issues, but I just want to make sure that they're still communicating on any items that we could be helping the school board out uh, post COVID-19, uh, getting ready for the up and coming school year. Absolutely. We've asked them for some help too. So, right. It's a two way street. And I think yeah. that when you're dealing with kids, sometimes you got to go a little beyond the, uh, the effort there. That's all. Understood. Uh, the other item I, I'd like to talk with you about is we have we had that meeting scheduled on the 14th. We won't have another meeting until July 28th. That's almost seven weeks from now. Um, so I, I'd like to talk with you about how the board feels about going ahead and having a regular board meeting on the 14th of July. I'm good. I, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with it. I would say that, you know, if if the load and work schedule is, I mean, we need to move things along. Um, you know, if we need to have two in July, then we need to have two in July. But if you can do one, I think uh, everybody be okay with one, whatever, I don't know what time constraints you have and concerns you have with the load of the schedule. But as long as business gets taken care of, I'm okay one or two. Commissioner Kerry. Well, Mr. Chairman, um... I know that we had we've gone to that schedule of a workshop the first at the first to uh, the second Tuesday and then a board meeting on the fourth. The only question that I would have if we're going to not have the work session is are we going to be ready? Do we we probably don't know the answer to this, but are we going to be ready to be meeting in the public at that point? And unless you had something really pressing, if we waited and had our meeting on the 28th, our county commission meeting on the 28th. We'd have a little more time to clear the deck to make sure that we could meet in the public and that the public could come back into the chambers. I mean, I, I that's just my thought on it. I don't, I mean, I'm prepared to be here for both meetings or one or the other. And I know we've only uh, planned on having these Zoom meetings, virtual meetings until the end of June. Um, but, you know, with a tick up of 
in, you know, increase and things like that, I'm, I'm just not sure that, you know, we're going to be ready to be back together again. So I, that's the only comment question I would okay. have. Yeah, I, go ahead. My, my recommendation is that we have two regular meetings in July, just because the July 28th meeting is, is seven weeks from now. And I, I don't want to hold up any business that we've got to do. Um, that being said, they might be very short meetings. Um, right now, the, under the governor's executive order, we're only authorized to have virtual meetings through the end of June. So that, that sort of, and that was our plan originally. This is a dynamic situation though, it could change. Our, my hope is that we'll be back to some, to, to some type of, um, we'll be in a circumstance where we'll be able to have um, our regular meetings. And, and the plan right now is to, resume regular meetings in July. But as Alan told you this morning, things things change daily. We are only authorized through the end of the month under the governor's order to, to continue these types of meetings. Yeah, for, I mean, it can't happen soon enough for me to get people back together in a safe fashion, face-to-face, uh, -face, just old school. Um, so, okay, any other things, Ms. Kate, Ms. Lockhart, Commissioner Lockhart? On, on the topic of the 14th, if we've canceled the school board work session right now the only work session we have scheduled is in the afternoon so if there's a way that we could have our regular meeting in the morning and still i just i don't want to get back into that situation where we're compressing our work sessions and feeling rushed through those um but i'm fine mm -hmm. with having a regular meeting well if we have if public hearings have all been scheduled for 1 30 in the after i mean they've been advertised for 1 30 in the afternoon maybe what we do is move the afternoon workshop the workshop up to the morning and then have our meeting in the afternoon and start with the public hearings and then take up the consent agenda after that just kind of flip it around a little bit yeah. I'll, I'll work with the county manager to, to arrive at what works best for everybody i i would like to know to the point of holding up business um, let's let's clarify any applicants or anything that might hold things up and understand that. Uh, Commissioner Constantine? My comment was along the lines of what Commissioner Lockhart indicated. I see on the 14th that we had uh, two uh, work sessions, uh, both affordable housing and information services, GIS, um, in, in the afternoon. You know, we could, we could, um, you know, they don't look like, I don't know how long they're going to be. Maybe we could do everything in the afternoon. Like you said, you'll talk with them and that's fine. The 28th, though, we had to have a meeting, obviously, because we're, uh, that's the date that we adopt the uh, trim. Uh, trim rate. Right. So uh, I don't have a problem with having two meetings. That's fine. If you can make one shorter and put the work sessions in there with that, that would be great. Okay. I, I would just like to have the option if we've got business items that can't wait until the 28th, that there's no objection to us scheduling them on the 14th. Mr. Carey. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know, we kind of did this scheduling of as a trial to have workshops on the second Tuesday and a commission meeting on the fourth Tuesday. And if we see that that's not working, because if we're holding up business, then we probably need to look at going back to our regular schedule of two commission meetings and workshops either in between after hours or on a separate day. No, understood completely. And, and yeah. we've been monitoring that um, as well. That's well. why I was a little surprised to hear that we were, you know, that the comment about we might be holding up business. So if we're holding up business, I want to talk about the whole schedule for the rest of this year. Yeah, exactly. And we know, we know we've had applicants and business people that have said they've put their own stuff on hold because of the COVID and all the other things that are evolving. So. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a strategy and make sure everybody's, you know, included in that, of course. Okay, Ms. Gay, anything further? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Chairman, the only other comment I'd have before you go to the county attorney, I mean, we have a closed session that's scheduled to happen between now and our 1.30 meeting. Well, we're not going to be back at 1.30, I can tell you that. Well, can we put our, can we put our, uh, commission reports on hold till the afternoon and maybe do the close yes. on, so that, that we can convene at 1 30 for the public hearing because that's well that that's my intent do that. That, that's my intent but uh i can tell you right now we're not gonna be back at 1 30 or let's just shorten our reports well so. i well, i'll let the county attorney speak to this but i think it i think at 1 30 that we have to start the public hearings 
would certainly avoid any confusion on the public's part, particularly with the Zoom and the call-ins. Uh, I think we need to start at 1.30. Okay. Uh, we put the closed session off until at the afternoon, so Brian. We, we could do that. Uh, Lynn, are you on, or is uh, our outside counsel on the call right now? Doesn't look like it. Okay, so here's what I propose. Um, we can close the meeting now when we come back. We'll take the county attorney's report. We can do our commission reports at the end of this afternoon's schedule. Um, we can put off the closed door session till after the afternoon session. Um, unless the county attorney's report's real quick and sweet. I have nothing. We already covered it. Good. So why don't we- uh, Mr. Adjourn. Chairman, I just have one quick thing. Sure. Um, in our discussion about the, the, the um, consent items, uh, we had a talk about 14, and that was after Mrs. Miss Buckheit called in about the uh, survey. Uh, I received an email both from our surveyors as well as Miss Buckheit, and I just wanted to say that the, um, I'm going to read the first line, and taking a look at the document, this is from our, uh, our, our surveyor uh, reference below, Miss Buckheit is correct. And he wanted to say, my apologies to Ms. Buckeye for the confusion my statement may have caused. I just wanted that for the record. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, we're going to adjourn until 1.30. Everybody's got just about a half hour or so. We'll see everybody back then. <laughs>